All righty. Well, here's what we're going to do. I mean, I just want to get get this show started now because it is officially almost go time. We got about a minute, just about a minute before it's official start time. So, but you guys out there all know that know the drill. Um, you know, that's the, the name of the show, of course, is Takeo After Dark, and uh, this is again part seven of our summer school. Part eight. And uh, Takeo After Dark was a kind of a, a, a just an idea that we were kicking around with John Messenbrink and Tim Ward from Mechanical Hub about back it started back in april but hey what do we what what can we do to kind of communicate during this quarantine and this COVID thing and we just come came across the idea of takeo after dark and doing it on wednesday nights when a lot of people were home and after after work make it kind of a night school kind of thing um even though with the further west you go it becomes takeo after lunch we apologize for that but that's that's time zones you know there's not much we can do about it uh, and it kind of the first series kind of took off and then we finished and we decided to do a summer school after that. So, again, we're 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 pleased that uh, that you you folks have joined us. We've had a, a really great turnout uh, in both in the spring and, and throughout the summer. So we're really happy about that. And we really appreciate you being here. Of course, um, there's our, our our mascot for Takeo After Dark, Bruce Campbell, the actor. Uh, in, in the original series, he was in an ascot and a smoking jacket in a in a very fancy library. Uh, but since it's summer school, we figured we'd give him a mojito and stick him in a hot tub. All right. So uh, if we could, to to kind of better reflect the informal nature of of Takeo After Dark, the summer school session. So tonight, of course, is the finale. Really quickly. Just want to make sure if you if there are any first timers here, just make sure you know how to navigate through the control panel. Uh, if and you don't know how to do this yet, they should fail the class. Well, yeah, I think over. so. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> but I got Sorry, the slide. I got to go through yeah. it. All right. <laughs> yeah, they're gonna have to do summer school again in the winter. Yeah, you, if you you, you got remedial <laughs> summer school, you're gonna go back a grade and just start all over again. <laughs> uh, you see the control panel, that little orange arrow. It's pointing to the left. Uh, click on it and it'll expand your control panel. The part we care about is way down at the bottom. All right, that is where you'll type in your questions and comments. So everybody who's out there, please do me a favor. We've got a bunch of you who've already figured that part out. Okay, but I've got we got about 50 folks out there. So if you could do, just do me a favor, type in a hi, hello, how are you? And uh, that way we know that you know that we know that you can hear us and we can continue. And uh, we're gonna continue. We'll keep doing that throughout the night just to make sure we haven't lost any. Uh, any uh, any connectivity to it. We were uh, talking on a webinar earlier today that unless we get feedback every once in a while, we don't know if the, everything is gone blank, right? If we if we totally lost connection and we're sitting here talking to ourselves like 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 a bunch of like a bunch of dopes. But but let, okay, I teed that one up for you. You can say whatever you want now. Um, but anyway, um, so we've got a we've got a great group here, a group of of six, uh, um, uh, well five experts plus me, so that's six of us. So we're really psyched to have you all here. And uh, well, let, let's get this kind of show on the road. OK, let's get started. Now, I know I'm, I'm assuming the role of Alexander Hamilton. For some reason, Dave chose to be Aaron Burr. OK, I don't know if you can see my my T-shirt. I said I'm not throwing away my shot. Um, knowing full well that Aaron Burr is the guy that killed <laughs> Alexander Hamilton. So I don't know if I should watch my back. I don't know. Um, we still need to find roles for everybody else here. Um, I'm thinking, Bruce, you're going to make a great Thomas Jefferson, all right? Uh, one of my favorite parts. Rick, George Washington, I think, might work for you. Dan and Dan and uh, and um, and Tim, we're going to have to figure out roles for you. I think there's uh, there 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 are roles here for both of you, but you know, not because neither of you would have shot me in the back like like uh, like uh, like Dave chose to do with Aaron Burr. Thanks a lot, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Um, uh, we're going to start. I, I'm going to I'm going to jump in and do my part first and then hand it over to these other guys. Again, like I said, we, we've prepared like maybe five minutes each, five to ten minutes each on the topics that um, that, uh, that 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 kind of are near and dear to us to kind of give you just a little bit of background and fill out some blanks. Uh, Rick, you had a you wanted the guys to kind of vote. Right. Which what are your two topics? Um. Well, just being able to read what the circulator is doing uh, as it stands for GPM within the system and actually using the pressure across the pump to determine that or uh, how we use CV and valve authority to size like a three-way mixing valve, like one of our I valves. So those are the two topics. Okay. So for those of you out there, just type in which one you'd rather have Rick do. 
All right. Uh, if you'd rather have to talk about CV or CV and valve authority or how to read flow across a pump. So uh, type, just type in your, your preferences and, and Rick will do whichever one you want. Um, I'll, I'll start with my section and then D and Dave, you are going to talk about tips and tricks. Um, and then we'll, we'll open it up and have our guests, uh, guests uh, jump in um, with, with, with their own areas of expertise. Uh, both Dan and Tim, Boiler guys extraordinaire. I mean, they, they, they again don't know anybody knows more about boilers than these guys do. And then Bruce is again as the smartest man I know. Specialties include water uh, water treatment, combustion analysis, and re and boiler piping. So anything along those lines. Got questions for Bruce as well? Uh, please feel free to jump in with those. I'm going to talk about what happens when zone valves close in a zone valve system. If you have a fixed speed circulator. And if you have a variable speed circulator, what happens when zone valves close? All right, some interesting dynamics take place in the system that we have to understand. And this will help you understand the value of variable speed circulators as well as the limitations of variable speed circulators. So what happens when zone valves close is basically what you have is a big traffic merge. See, I've got four zones wide open, all right? Four zones calling, that's all four zones. Everything's wide open, okay? Uh, everything's wide open, the pumps pumpulating, the boilers boilerating, and the water's flowing eight and right through the system. I've got four zones open. That's the maximum flow rate I could possibly have in that system at any point in time, right? All four zones are calling. Maximum flow rate I could possibly have in that system at any given point in time. As well as, I also have the lowest overall resistance to flow because all four zones are open. So it's the highest possible flow and the lowest overall resistance to flow that's possible within that system. Now, when a zone valve closes, the circulator being a fixed speed, fixed pump curve circulator, is still creating the same amount of combined flow and head energy. But all of a sudden, I don't have four holes for the water to go through, I only have three. So my flow has to go down, okay? The flow has to go down. So with all zones calling, again, everything's wide open, maximum flow, least resistance, but as zones satisfy, I get increasing flow resistance and reducing, and I've reduced flow as well. Because I can't get the same amount with the same pump, I can't get the same amount of flow through three holes as I can through four. You know, unless my unless my system curve gets really, really weird. And that, and that is possible. That is possible. So uh, it's just it's kind of the nature of what happens. Now, what does this look like? Okay, what does this look like? Well, what we have is a system curve shift, okay? We talked about system curves both in the in, in our original series and in this series. Um, a system curve is the hydraulic fingerprint of your heating system, of any piping circuit, if you will. It's the it's the the hydraulic fingerprint. And what it tells us is as flow goes up, head loss or pressure loss through that piping circuit will go up exponentially. That's why these are kind of these aren't straight lines, they're kind of curved. These lines here represent system curves. Now, a, a multiple zone zone valve system will have a whole bunch of system curves, all right? A whole bunch of different system curves, one system curve for each combination of zones that are calling. For example, what we're looking at here is a three zone zone valve system. A three zone zone valve system will have seven different system curves because that's the combinations that you're dealing with. Let's count them out. Zone one by itself, zone two by itself, zone three by itself, zones one and two, zones one and three, zones two and three, and zones one, two, and three. That's seven different system curves, all right? Seven different system curves. With a fixed speed circulator and with a delta P variable speed circulator, I'm going to have seven different points of intersection uh, on the pump performance curve, seven different points of intersection. So you're going to you're going to have different flow and head characteristics. I remember doing a seminar out in uh in um I think it was in Wisconsin and a guy said was talking about variable speed circulators. He says he said, "Hey, all I know is when a zone valve closes, flow goes down. That's all I know. And that's why these things are great because when a zone valve closes, flow goes down." And I had to tell him, "Oh, dude, that's going to happen. That's going to happen in a fixed speed circulator too. When a zone valve closes, flow goes down." All right, it's still running the same speed, but flow goes down. It kind of has to. And here's why. Let's take a look at this system now. Um, at, these are my different system curves. Let's say my system requirement, for just for giggles and grins, my system requirement is seven gallons a minute at five feet ahead, all right? Seven gallons a minute at five feet ahead. So this is my system curve right here with all zones calling. 
the actual point of intersection, and I'm using a 007 here as an example, is going to be at about nine and a half gallons a minute at what looks to be about eight feet ahead. Not bad. That's that's okay. That's okay. I'm 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 getting more flow than I need. My delta T is going to be smaller than the 20 I've designed for, but this is not an outrageous. This is not an outrageous system. As zone valves close, we get a system curve shift, okay? We get a system curve shift. So this is all zones calling. This might be zones one, one and two, or two and three, or one, two and three, whatever. Another combination of zones calling. A new system curve is going to intersect right here. And as you can see, the flow goes down. The flow goes down, but because we're working on this pump curve, remember we have said this in past episodes, when you have a fixed pump performance curve circulator, like a fixed speed circulator, or like a delta P in constant pressure, or proportional pressure for that matter, it's going to have a fixed performance curve. That curve's not going to move. We're just going to intersect at different points. So what happens here is my speed, my RPM stays the same, but I've closed off one of the holes, so flow goes down. In this case, it goes from 9.5 gallons a minute to what looks to be about 8.5 gallons a minute. But the flow goes down, you can see the head pressure differential goes up slightly because I have to work on that pump curve. And as we go back and to the left on the pump curve, flow is going to go down as zones close. But the head pressure differential created by the circulator is going to go up. In this case, we're using a flat curve pump with a zone valve system. And I've said this before, guys, a flat curve pumps and zone valves go together like cake and ice cream. All right. They go to, they were made for one another. OK, they were perfect for one another because, as you will see here, big changes in flow, big changes in flow result in relatively small changes in head pressure differential created by the circulator. Now, why is that important? Why do we care about this? We care about this only in relation to what would happen with a steep curve circulator. A steep curve circulator. Now, this is a curve. This is contractor no callback mode on your three-speed pump. And, and I'm telling you, after, after years and years of thinking about it, I've come to the conclusion that the three-speed pump might have been the worst thing we've ever sold you guys. I, 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 honestly, I honestly believe three-speed circulators have created more problems than they've stalled, all right? Uh, and it's just the way it is. I think, I think their days are numbered. I think they're dead pumps walking. They just don't know it yet. But three-speed pumps to me are not the answer. They're, they're, they're not a solution. They're kind of a, a new problem that we have to come up with new solutions for. But that's a different soapbox for a different day. Um, here I have the, this is, this is speed three of a typical three-speed circulator, whether it's the Taco 0015 standard efficiency, whether it's the Grundfos 1558, they're virtually the same set of pump curves, all right? As you can see, all zones calling, I'm kind of intersecting in, in the same spot, and that's just happenstance for this particular example. But as you can see, as the zone valves close, as the zone valves close, yes, flow goes down, but look what's happening to the head pressure differential. The head pressure differential is going up, up, up. Why does that matter? Why does that matter? Well, again, we, it matters in terms of banging zone valves primarily. This is how zone valves bang. Zone valves don't like closing against that kind of head pressure differential. All right, they, they, they'll let you know that they're having a problem with it by banging, that by making a, you know, it's like a water hammer noise. In some cases, depending upon what type of zone valve you're using, and if you really overcook the pump, you can actually blow by the zone valves. That's very common with the power open spring return synchronous motor paddle type zone valves. That you can you can have you can go you can blow past those fairly easily if you overcook the pump. So in this case, this is just nature. This is what's going to happen with a steep curve pump with zone valves. You're going to get that banging zone valve. You might get higher, you, more flow through those zones than you would get with, with, a, with a flatter curve pump, which is not necessarily a good thing if we're over pumping anyway, that delta T is going to get smaller still. And what we have here is a, you know, if, if, if a flat curve pump and zone valves go together like cake and ice cream, a steep curve pump and zone valves go together like tuna fish and ice cream. It's just not a good mix. All right. It's just not a good mix. What do people do to deal with this? Well, for some idiotic reason, it has become the 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 industry standard. Well, I'm I use I have to put in a pressure differential bypass valve. 
that's what you do with zone valve jobs. I have to put in a pressure differential bypass valve. No, in this example, a pressure differential bypass valve is simply a Band-Aid for a self-inflicted wound. It's the price you have to pay for using the wrong pump for this application. What does a pressure differential bypass valve do? In its simplest form, it turns a steep curve pump into a flat curve pump. Well, Glorioski, Captain Kilowatt, if, we, if, if all it does is turn a steep curve pump into a flat curve pump, why the heck wouldn't we use a flat curve pump in the first place? Makes sense to me. You guys, what do you, the, my, my, my five hosts, what do you think? Okay. I agree. They're, they're stupefied. They don't think anything. <laughs> <laughs> Or, or, yeah. or did you, or did you, at some point did they say, was it over when the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor? Oh, forget it, he's rolling. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I don't like to interrupt. You're going, man. Just as long as nobody just says yeah. the word pressure differential bypass valve to you right now. Uh, Daniel Daniel Leary's kind of going there a little bit. I, he's, he's want, he wants to get me. He wants me to go on. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, a pressure differential, again, it's, it, there are instances where, yeah, you might want a pressure differential bypass valve, but I'd say out of, the, out of every 100 of these applications I've seen in my lifetime, one of them actually needs a pressure differential bypass valve. And, and, and here's the thing, Tim Dorn, you taught me that. You may not remember, but you taught me that. Well, I'm glad I did something in the 20 years we've known each other. Yeah, you, 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 yeah, I mean, you, you've annoyed me plenty over the years too. But then again, I've I've annoyed you, so that's that's kind of the the basis yeah, of our relationship. <laughs> yeah, that's we're symbiotic there for sure. There yeah. you go. <laughs> All right. Well, that kind of that kind of uh, wraps up my presentation. Again, with a steep curve pump, a big difference in big differences in flow, or actually even smaller differences in flow give you a, a bigger difference in delta P. And with a, flat, with, a, with a zone valve job, you simply don't want that. There are better ways to do zone valve jobs. So that was my shot, and I'm not throwing away my shot. I've got the T-shirt that says so. So who's up next? It's going to be uh, Rick or Dave? Well, Rickster, it looks like uh, based on the comments that I saw, everyone's looking for a little bit of uh, CV. CV won by about 75%. Okay. Nice. Then that's, that's what we'll do. All right, so why don't you uh, why don't you jump in there? Are you ready, ready. for it? Or uh, I just got to hit show uh, share screen, right? No, so. I got to make you the presenter first. There you go. Uh, you are now the presenter. presenter. Oh, we're gonna do a different one. Hmm. All right. Uh, let me move a couple things out of the way. Is everybody seeing that? I suppose. Not yet. Nope. Just see us. <laughs> there we go. Maybe there, there it is. There you go. Now we're talking. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, so a little. Actually, uh, hang on a second. One second. Um, I, I see a question that came in from Nick about what would uh, uh, one of the questions for John uh, was going uh, would going from I guess speed one versus oh going for M one versus three make a difference. Do you see the I'm guessing means speed one to speed three. Uh, it might make it, that, yeah. Yeah, it might make a difference in zone valve banging, but you also might find that it might not be enough to um, to actually because the curve is so steep. When all zones are calling under design conditions, you might not have enough flow or head to get the job done. It's a very it's, it's steep curve pumps and zone valves just a bad juju really just a bad marriage right there but yeah if you go down to speed one maybe the bone the banging stops but but you're gonna you're gonna seriously uh, uh, hurt your ability to deliver BTUs when it gets really cold out and that's the phone call nobody wants so so probably not I would say that's probably not gonna that'll make the banging stop but it it's and solve that problem but it'll create another one okay. Sorry about that. So now you can jump back, Rick. Okay. A uh, little review, uh, just because we're going to be talking about CV. So we'll just a couple slides to make sure everybody uh, is on the same page here. So flow coefficient is CV. Just understand that, uh, think of it like a benchmark, a test at which a device is measured, right? So at a certain amount 
of flow in North America, we're still using GPM. Where does it get us to one PSI pressure drop across that device? So imagine, you know, picture a test bench where they've got a valve and they're running water through it and they're able to test the uh, pressure across that device, okay? One, one good analogy, and, uh, you know, we've got bragging rights for the nicest zone valve in North America. This three-quarter inch sweat uh, zone century has a CV of 10.3. Well, what does that mean? That means it won't see a one PSI drop until we shove 10.3 gallons a minute through it, okay? There's a good picture of this, and uh, notice this would be in a, a static condition where nothing's flowing, pressure sitting at 15 PSI. If we turn the pump on and we send 10.3 gallons a minute, notice what happened over here to the downstream side of that valve. It shows a one PSI. So again, that's kind of like a stamp or a benchmark measurement of how that valve, you know, added up. That's so we can, you know, um, we can do a comparative with brand X, Y, and Z and you know, they might all have one inch valves, but let's see how they stack up against each other. And the CV test is one that does that. But it also helps us predict what's going to happen within a system if we know what that CV is. Here's the calculation simplified, okay? We're going to solve for what the head is by knowing what the GPM is. So we have to know what the GPM is. We divide that by whatever CV that valve has been listed with, and then we square that result to give us PSI. And then we just simply, same calculation we've always used to convert PSI to feet ahead, 2.31. So as an example, if I had five gallons a minute shoved through a valve with a CV of 1.89, that gives me 2.65. When I square that, 7 PSI times 2.31, that's 16 foot ahead. So un just understand how we use the CV to do calculations and to estimate what the pressure drop is going to be. We need to know that to, to go into this next little section, okay? So uh, here's just some pictures of our stuff, and this applies to everybody's product for the most part, right? So there's different types of the way that valves uh, are labeled as far as being either a quick opening or a linear valve or equal percentage valve and stuff. Just, we're not gonna get into all that tonight. We're just gonna talk about how to actually size the valve and make sure that you don't oversize it. Most of the time, people will oversize these valves for one simple reason, and I'll point that out, and, and hopefully anybody listening to this won't make that same mistake, okay? Again, we, we got five or six or 10 minutes at the most. I'm gonna go pretty fast here. So this is just kind of gives you a schematic idea of what we're doing, a four-way four valve up here. Uh, we got three-way valves. We got two of those right here and right here. And then we got this little two-way valve that's over here as a little injection valve. So again, we need to know uh, how to size these things to get them right, okay? So um, the first thing we'll talk about is what our particular job is going to be. We, you know, we need to do the math up front. And this particular job is going to have a requirement of seven gallons a minute, 10 foot ahead. And notice the way I said this. I said it a little bit different, right? Our system circulator will give us seven gallons a minute, 10 foot ahead. The, the idea here, uh, you folks may have heard us talking about this before, but we don't want the tail wagging the dog. Okay, you don't want the resultant pressure drop of a system. You want to design your system to fall within the parameters that you've preset for that particular job. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to you folks. Um, so, uh, so I'm making that point now. Seven gallons a minute, ten foot ahead. Okay, so pressure drop allowance typically on th this part of the system, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Okay, can be up to fifty percent. Okay, and it should be somewhere probably around 30 to 50% of the pressure drop within that portion of the system. That would be a good rule of thumb, okay? So notice what I'm talking about here. If this circulator is what I'm talking about, and that's where we're gonna do seven gallons a minute at 10 foot, I'm gonna size everything so that in a full open position, okay, that means I'm coming around this way and doing a full bypass, or excuse me, I'm coming out of here and doing a, a uh, fully opened configuration in that, OK? 
okay? So that's when we're talking about what the CV of the valve is. Should have clarified that. So hopefully that makes sense. In our case, we said it was seven gallons a minute. Remember this little quick, quick reference chart that's out there that just gives you two foot and four foot based on L copper, okay? So it's not gonna be three quarter inch, folks. Okay, so the pipe sizing for this particular project, if it was done correctly, would be one inch. Okay, just clarifying that, right? So cause always consider the CV of the valve first. Don't even think about the pipe size at the beginning of the job. You always look at what the CV characteristic of the valve is, okay? So here is just a cut and paste right out of our, um, our uh, manual, so to speak. If you were to open up our I-valve, uh, three, uh, I-series three-way valve, uh, you'll get this information. So you look at down here and you got half, you got one, two, three, six, eight. Where, uh, our, what was our flow? Seven, right? Uh-oh, I threw a curveball at you. Well, I can't just go over here and pick. Here's what I want you to think about, okay? I already know what my parameters are. I'm seven gallons a minute and I don't want to <laughs> exceed 10 foot ahead total. And But I can go up to around what? 30 to 50%. So that's what I want you to keep in mind. I'm going to look right here at this three-quarter inch that has a CV of 4.5 because I can extrapolate over here, but I'm actually going to do more than that. I'm actually going to show you how to calculate what it could be, okay? Because notice over here, we go, we give you six gallons a minute and we give you eight gallons a minute, and you can re see the resultant head under this column, right? Well, we've got a different number. You use that same calculation I showed you, Other, you take GPM that you're going to run through the valve, divide it by the CV of that valve, square that uh, result, that gives you PSI. So if you look, I mean, I would put 2.41 right here in the middle, right? And then I times that to 2.31 to give me my feet ahead. And I'm at 5.5 foot ahead. That's fairly close to 50% of 10 foot ahead. You see where I'm going with that now? In this case, notice over here that the one inch union style has the same CV. So I could use that as well because you gotta consider a couple things. First off, you say, well, is a one inch valve more money than a three quarter valve? I might wanna stay with a three quarter valve. However, if I've got to increase up in the pipe size and I've got some you know, configuration and, and you know, things to buy and a little bit more labor and stuff, I you know, I, it might be a wash. I might want to use this. So I'll leave that up to you folks to figure that out. Okay. Anyway, that's, uh, I'll leave, I'll, I'll kick it back to anybody else and uh, go from there. Very good. Any questions on CV? We had one that we've kind of been working on here trying to answer for Robert Dressler. So the higher the rated CV of the valve is always better? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I think Dave answered well in, in an open, close and on off like a zone valve. I'd say, yeah. Uh, but in a in a in a in a, uh, a motorized mixing valve, not always. Why not, Rick? Well, um, there's this thing that we use in our world, um, in our terminology, when something's not really doing, giving you the end result you're looking for. And we call that hunting. And so imagine this. The valve is bigger than it should be and it's in the closed position and all of a sudden you get a call for heat the call for heat says hey let's crank this valve open there's a sensor downstream that's saying i need to be a little warmer so the valve just starts to open up and right when it cracks its little valve opening all of a sudden it's got more flow than it actually needs right so whoa what does it do it senses that to close the valve back off again it opens up a little bit closes off again opens up a little bit and that's hunting that leads to premature valve uh, failure you know you're going to wear things out uh again that whole valve authority thing says it's going to open and it's going to get up to an appropriate opening that allows enough mix in there and it's going to hang right there it might bump a little bit open and a little bit close uh but we don't want it you know it it will float so to speak but it shouldn't hunt where it's open and closed. And we had the same problem with variable speed injection mixing. All the pumps right. were too big. They weren't sizing the pipes right. Uh, so that that whole hunting thing is is something to be concerned about and all the more reason to sharpen your pencil and to get it right. Right. Yeah, basically, what I, I was looking at it is 
the, a, a higher CV valve will have less pressure drop, but it also has a wider hunt. All right. Um, you know, I mean, uh, Tim, you're you're a, you're a hunter. Do you want to be hunting in a big wide area, or do you want to narrow your hunt? Right. The problem the problem with a with an oversized valve in the hunting is also that it starts a pendulum effect in some cases. Yeah, yeah your water so, temperatures all over the place. So, yeah. So what starts out is a little bit of open close, open close gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So you get these radical uh, temperature swings. So you have to be careful with that and depending what you're working with if it's on a if it's on a building control system the guys can tune the valve a little bit to try to save your bacon but you're better off putting the right valve in and, and what tim was talking about by temperature sacrificing temperatures is, is the air temperature in the space it's going to go up and down a lot not necessarily the, fl the floors are going to go up and down but then the air temperature starts to have a wide differential too so uh sure everything you, you're mi yeah. your mixed outlet temperature is going to go nuts yeah. and therefore your surface temperature is going to go nuts as well on the floor or uh, whatever you're trying to mix for. Very good. All right. Now, Bruce, did you, you didn't prepare anything, did you? Oh, I don't have any slides. Just uh, my voice. There you go. Well, again, Bruce is, like you said, he's the smartest dude I know uh, in terms of both. both uh, what If you had to give the, give the group some advice on combustion analysis, you know, just two quick items on on combustion analysis, two things you want them to leave here with, what would it be? Well, for one, you never ever touch the equipment or do anything with the equipment without taking a test. And that includes tune-ups, uh, which is absolute gospel with tune-ups, but any kind of adjustments you make, as soon as you make an adjustment, you just change it. And you, you, so you have to do a, a combustion analysis every time you do anything with the equipment. And that's oil, gas, it, it doesn't matter what the tool is. Uh, and beyond that, uh, you, you need good equipment. And that's an, a, an electronic analyzer. Wet kits are so obsolete, it's, <laughs> it, yeah. it's crazy. I mean, it's like you're talking about technology from the 30s. So uh, you really need a good analyzer, and you know there's lots of choices out there. So uh, you know I'm, I don't I don't promote one over another. You have to make your own decision. How much do you want to spend? Do you want a do you want a Chevy or do you want a Mercedes? So it's it's uh, it depends on on what you need. But it, an electronic analyzer is is absolutely necessary in today's in today's world. What would someone see? What would the difference be between a Chevy and a and a Mercedes combustion analyzer? What would what would the what would did what would the what would the Mercedes do for the contractor that the Chevy wouldn't? Well, all right, the Mercedes would give you a lot more uh, capability, uh, Wi-Fi, for instance, uh, communication ability, uh, a much wider range of, of of abilities, more things that it can do. Uh, I think they all have printers today, so that's 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 kind of a given. But uh, it, it's really, it, it comes down to capabilities. And also, uh, to me, one of the important things is it's the ability to do some of your own service. They all need maintenance, but changing the oxygen, if you can do that yourself rather than send it away someplace, to me, that, that, that would be a big key. Uh, when you have to send it out for service, well, and you don't have it, you need it, you can't do your job without it, but just waiting for it to come back from Kokomo, Indiana, or wherever. And uh, so what do you do? You don't have your tool. So if you can do your routine service on it uh, yourself, that, that, that is a, 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 a good selling point. Yeah, otherwise you need, you need your analyzer plus a backup one. Well, yeah, so yeah, now yeah. You, if you're you one need another one, so a spare. <laughs> <laughs> well, having, having, spare, spare you know. yeah. having spares is good, you know, it's never a bad thing. No, no. It's, <laughs> But, and Anthony, uh, Anthony says he wants a Mercedes at a Chevy price. Well, don't no, we all? Sure, don't, we, don't we all? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, right. again, looking at the Chevy, the Chevy isn't going to give you all those features. Uh, you know, I, I look at some of the uh, lower end models as throwaways. They're good for a, a couple of years and you throw it away. Well, that's that's you know you get you get what you pay for. Sure, and that may be okay for someone too, because then you don't really have to maintain it. You just you, all the way. Get another one. You're done. Sure. Okay. Very good. All right. Well, uh, are we ready to go to Mr. Burr, sir? Sure.
Sure, Mr. Burr, sir. Sure. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, make you the presenter here, uh, Mr. Burr, sir. Nope. You are already the presenter. You've done it yourself. I took care of it. Yes. So, all righty. Got a couple of things. I'm going to jump actually into the more of the install side of things and taking a look at the product rather than um, some of the math and, and some of the other stuff that we've done over the time. So I'm just going to jump into some of the stuff that I've got sitting around here that I think will be useful. And, and from what I've seen out there a lot of times, which has been looking a little bit different. So, uh, but with that being said, first, those of you that were on last week realized that we did not get to give stuff away. So I've got two giveaways I need to give up, get out. So this is some of the stuff that uh, that's in my giveaway package. So um, you guys can see this. Oh yeah, you do. Yes, okay. Making sure we, everything's. We got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so got a couple of hats in there. We got ourselves a Bluetooth speaker, uh, a couple of koozies because you can no, never have too many koozies, right? Uh, the coffee mug that will always lose at somebody's house, sitting on top of the water heater, right? You know, and I uh, got a couple of masks and some of the Takeo stickers out there. So from week six trivia and week seven, I have to give away some stuff. So let me change which screen I'm showing. And let me give those away first before we give anything away. So here it is. So let's tap in and let's see who's going to win something uh, from week six. I don't remember what the trivia was that day. So we're just going to have to roll with it. Tap to spin. All right. <clears throat> Let's see who's got it. Looks like it's going to be me. <laughs> Go again. <laughs> of course, of course, out of, the, out of all of them that I've had. First time that's ever happened. All right. It looks like we've got Jerry McPeak. Jerry, I will email you during the class today. I know you're online. I saw you there. So I'll give you a quick email um, and get you for week six. So, and then week seven. All right, where'd it go? Uh oh. No way. It was no all way. there. I had all the names typed in there. Oh, there it is. There it is. There's all right. week sevens. All right. So let's click on week seven's name. And Samuel. A two-time winner. All right, a two-time winner of our of the of the of the, the Takeo After Dark trivia. Excellent. Yes. So excellent. I know it, it was. He was probably from the spring session, if I remember correctly. So yep. I will give you guys a call and uh, an email, and we will get rolling with that. So with that being hey, said, yes, hey, sir. Dave, um, Bruce Hiller's got a question about um, if he was going to use a three-quarter inch mixing valve and he had inch and a quarter pipe, do we need to consider the reducers in the pipe? And yes, but it's kind of hard to nail down. What, one thing that we know for a fact is that when we reduce down, we get an, a Venturi effect and it actually uh, lowers the CV rating. For instance, um, the ball in our one inch valve is virtually the same as our three quarter valve. So one would think, well, one inch should be a higher CV. Well, no, it actually is slightly less because when we test it, you get the pipe reduction and you get the Venturi effect and it actually causes a little more pressure drop. So, um, but nothing to be uh, too alarmed about. Uh, uh, as long as you've done a good job on your numbers, Bruce, you should be okay. Excellent. Very good. All right. And hey, people, while you're sitting out there, too, don't forget, we've got a couple of uh, uh, great boiler guys that are hanging out with us today, too, uh, from Will McLean. So type in any questions that you have out there to everybody. We'll make sure that we get them in with these guys. Um, you, know, you know, we've been most of the time, Rick, John and myself, what we've been talking about is, hey, after it gets hot. We'll take care of it from there. So, but it's got to get hot first. So, we got these two guys hanging out with us, and Bruce too. Uh, he knows a thing or two about boilers, also. So, uh, make sure you type any any comment, question, anything you got out there. Please bring that in. I have a so. question for Dan. How's the carpet cleaning going? Well, the guy finished before we started at the last minute, so that was very good. <laughs> All right, very good. Isn't it amazing when they clean the carpets? It, it nothing makes a. It, it's amazing the crap that sits in there. 
<laughs> I just uh, uh, well maybe you you maybe you have you have a little cleaner lifestyle than I do because whenever I clean carpets I go ew. <laughs> <laughs> So that might be more of a problem on my end than anything else. So moving right along, talk, talk, Dave. I, I think so, yes. yes. It does sound like it's more of an issue there. So, yes. All right. So I want to talk about a um, couple of double O's uh, E-series circulators for installs. And, you know, I, I'm on a lot of the social media sites, a lot of the pictures. I, I see lots of job sites out there. And I see lots of circulators getting installed, wired, uh, and... Um, put in in this respect yeah meaning horizontal all right but the 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 lettering is upside down or, or sideways here or we're seeing it completely upside down so i want to point out i want to show you guys i did a little mock-up over the weekend uh, uh i mean actually today on on putting something together here for you and i'm going to move the camera so we can just see how we can do this let me make sure that camera looking good there all right, make sure that doesn't fall over. How are we doing there? All right, we got that circ in the screen. Bring the microphone over. All right, so it's going to be an eighth inch Allen key. So if you want to make the boiler room just look a little, you want to make the boiler room look a little bit different, look a little bit better, let's get this thing so it's reading properly. Or, or maybe your electrical box is pointing down and we want to pull that electrical box up high. So eighth inch Allen key. I took a couple out already. What I want you to do. Just take out those two, you know, those, those four Allen bolts. And now we'll be able to have the opportunity to spin this around and get it reading in the right position. So watch what happens here. If you've ever taken a standard double O apart, our standard AC style circulars, once you took that last bolt out, you know the circ was hitting the deck. This is going to stay in place for you right now. It's not going to go anywhere. There's an O-ring seal on the inside. So what I want you to do is great. install the circulator first in your system. You don't want to do this on the workbench. You don't want to do it on the floor. So just go ahead, grab the motor and give it a turn. All right, do not pull it apart because if you happen to pull it apart, you may have the opportunity of pinching that O-ring and then just go back and reinstall. All right, just get those nuts back in there, those bolts back in using your eighth inch Allens and you're done. Tighten them down. We're not looking at a three-foot cheater bar, but it's going to get you to where it lines up to where you want it to be. So making that job site just look a little bit better as you put these things back together again. Um, making sure the letters are lined up. There's some that don't care, and that's fine too. Circulator still works. It's still going to move water around. You don't necessarily have to go ahead and make sure that it's, it's all lined up properly. So it's still going to do a good job. So I just wanted to point that out. If you do happen to take the whole thing apart and it falls apart in your hands or if you pull it apart, my suggestion is to take the motor and lay it down flat. So get the motor on your workbench. All right, rest it flat on the workbench down this way. There's an O-ring right here. And you may have to wiggle and push down that casing down on top of here in order to get it to seat. Try not to do it the other way around. You want that nice flat edge right here. Get that flat edge on your workbench on the floor, wiggle the casing down so it goes back into place that way. Much easier to do it that way. The other thing I want to point out, <clears throat> okay, is taking a look at the zone sentry and and doing some some housekeeping on the zone sentry systems out there so one we have this little retainer clip that's on the bottom here and in order to pop off this power head it's just really pushing in that little retainer clip on the bottom side of it and i'll throw it in the camera here if you can get it get an eyeball on that so just push that tab in and it releases in order to change out that power head what's nice also about this is that the stem is a d-ring all right so you just uh it only goes on in one direction so if you happen to take it off it doesn't get back on there you're going to have to rotate it to get it to go and line back up and then you've got a couple of locking tabs right here this is what holds these power heads in place this it holds the it grabs the body because of the torque that it has to really pull this thing around we have two locking posts in order to grab onto here 
And if you happen to have your install, let's take a look at these two that you have here. All right. Uh, you happen to install the valve bodies backwards from one to the other. There is no arrows on the valve body. You might take a look at this one here and you see an A and a B on the casting. It means absolutely nothing in a zone sentry for a heating zone. It's just a casting designation that we have in there. So these can go in any direction. There's no arrow. So if you happen to install the valve bodies, but then look at the power heads, one's pointing down, the other one's pointing up. Well, if you want it to look good, you release that tab, but do not pull it completely off. Just get it past the locking tabs, spin it around while it's in place, while it's still on the D stem, and then push it back in and you're done. So now you're getting it to line back up again. But this is also what I suggest doing when these valves are brand new. You take a look at that little, in the picture there, you see that that knob, if you wanted to do a manual override, a little tough to grab your fingers onto this thing. Don't use a wrench to get that valve to open up for the first time. What I want you to do, when you pull this thing off for the first time, get it separated, break the seal with the power head on that valve stem so this way when you go to install it and you want to do your purging manual purge you've broken the seal of your ball valve so every time you install when you go to take this thing off just take it off there you go break your seal a little bit and now i'll be able to manually open and close those valves so just a little tip there on on some zone valves and Last but not least that I want to talk about is taking a look at some wiring. So here's something that I've messed around with. Uh, I learned from my cousin a few years ago. <clears throat> and my cousin's an electrician, works in Manhattan. And he came over, did some work at my house one day. We had the electrical box open. And he had this pile of Romex floating around. All right. And he just went and grabbed a few pieces of them and cut off four to five foot sections i mean four to five inch sections little pieces of romex like this was laying all over the toolbox and he pulled the wire out got rid of the wire kept the jacket so this is jacket that wasn't sliced a lot of a lot of electricians will slice it this was still completely solid uh, all the way around what he used this for was labeling the wires and he would take as the electrical panel was off all his leads going into each breaker had the label of where it went. When the cover goes back on, then you write back on top of it what it was. But I took it to the next level and said, wiring my thermostats and wiring zone valves into a zone valve control. I've seen guys take the magic marker and write on the outside of the cover, or you take a, a piece of tape and tape it to the, to the thermostat wire. That tape disappears after time. We have no idea what it is any longer. I thought this was a, a most perfect benefit to take a look at you take, see this this was a job site that I was working on uh, this is at my cousin's house so I was now taking his um, no uh, his little trick and I applied it to his house and doing some wiring there so now we know exactly what's going on and these will never fade away and never get lost so I love that little tip uh, that I learned for wiring you got zone valves you've got manifolds of radiant floors with actuators oh my god anybody wire up a, a six zone manifold with actuators on it there's a lot of wires hanging out there so uh so i love to do that part of it too so i thought this was a great little tip that i learned a few years ago just wanted to pass that along i try to use it on every job i can and we've always seen you know what do you do with a five foot section of romex we throw it away keep it on the truck for your wiring uh, to label your wires so that's pretty much what i got there brother not bad mr trainer of the year <clears throat> did did we make that announcement last week did the, did, the, did the world get to know yes we did because i had to jump on and off i was doing both at the same yeah, time yeah so uh, uh, bruce Let's tim and dan, 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 i don't know if you knew dave, dave was named trainer of the year the dan hollahan trainer of the year award for oesp the oil and energy service providers organization <coughs> the uh naosium yeah, very well deserved. Very, very, very proud, Dave. Very Absolutely. Good. good for you, man. Good for Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah. All righty. Very good. Hey, where's your plaque? Oh, yeah. Show us the plaque, Dave. 
he takes it everywhere with him. You know, I mean, he's he's he, every he brings it to the supermarket with him now. He shows the 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 the, the, the guy at the register. He shows he shows that he's, he went to get his car washed last week. He brought it to the car wash so they could see it too. I mean, he's very proud of this. <laughs> There it is. So had there to move it away since I was doing some work down here today. So that is awesome. Thank yeah. you, Bruce. Very good. Good for you, Dave. Give it a golf clap. Damn. That's a I think we that's an eagle clap. It deserves an eagle clap. I think. Very good. All righty. Well, hey, that that that's our our our, our regular presentation. But we got stuff, we got we got guys here, so question away. We got Jimmy De Palma, who's with us from Wales Darby, who's out in the house. How you doing, Jimmy De Palma? What did we didn't we have a nickname for Jim De Palma a couple of weeks ago? I forget what we said. Who did he who did he remind us of? It was uh, the perfect. Oh, now it's starting to annoy me because you reminded. It was that brilliant momentary inspiration, and now it's gone forever. The French knight. Oh yes, you were the French, French knight, knight. From Monty Python. <laughs> Go away or I shall taunt you a second time. That is a French Jimmy De Palma. It's <laughs> very good. Very good. And Scott Helen Drunk says, I'm imagining Dave with the plaque hanging from his neck with a big gold chain. Yeah. Yeah, a little flavor flavor. Flavor. Yeah, flavor. That's right. That's what I was trying to think about. Flavor flavor. That's right. That's right. All right. Well, cool. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't have a chain uh, that big though. You gotta get some more gold. Yeah, well, you're gonna I need a raise so I can get the table. That's a plaque and a half right there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tim and Dan, what's new in the boiler world? What, uh, what, when you, what would these guys, if you, if you had a, a room full of, well, let's say 70 contractors or 70 folks in the industry, and you wanted to make sure they knew one or two things about today's boilers, what would they be? Wow, there's a good question. What do you think, Dan? Well, today's boilers, now for those on uh, from Tago know that uh, I've only been in the boiler industry for five years. So I grew up in the trades, I'm an electrician by trade, and I work with a lot of abstract, when you work with electricity, it's very abstract. When I got into the hydronics world, I wanted to, to start teaching some classes at Michigan City at our factory for distributor training. And uh, I kind of just took it to the common sense level. So with the boilers today, you gotta understand the boiler and you have to really spend some time reading the manual, asking questions and learn about the boiler before you put the boiler in. Because as Rick, Dave and John know, nobody calls any other manufacturer. No one calls Taco, no one calls Wurzbo, nobody calls uh, Nitsko, the piping guy. Nobody calls Kalepi when that boiler stops running. So when that system is out of balance and something's jacked out of whack, the boiler guys get the call. So if you've been on these calls, uh, John and Dave and Rick have been saying my little jokes as we've been going here. So you gotta really pay attention to the, the boiler. So learn the equipment a little bit, really understand the system and you need the system to operate properly. Because if one of the sensors on the boiler goes out of whack, then you you might be um, you know, going off on high limits or you're just, you're not operating as efficiently as you can. So if you're gonna put a 95% boiler in, let's try to make it run as efficiently as you can for the system, okay? And if something's not right with the system, then it's not right. If you were in your own house, I know you would cut out those five 90s that are within a foot and a half and repipe that. So when you're on a job site, please make your, you know, make, look at the overall system and try to help yourself out, especially when you're in the boiler room, if you can spend an extra few minutes and make a few corrections to the system. That'd be my tip of the day. Very good, very good. Tim, how about you? Oh, I think for me, there are a couple of things. I, I would echo what Bruce said earlier. Um, combustion analysis is a must today. There's no more by eye um, combustion setup. Uh, and yeah, we fire things at the factory, but we're firing them under known conditions. Your job site conditions will vary. Yeah. Uh, and you have, you have to set things up real world, real time. And I think my other one, my, my pet peeve for how many years has been do the math, mm -hmm. right? Um, today, I think the math is more important than ever. You know, when we had high math 
spoilers, high water content. Yeah, if you if you missed the math a little bit, who cares? Right? It was very forgiving. You had a big buffer zone to absorb energy and 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 help you out. And you know, flow velocity through the boiler wasn't that big of a deal. If you were roughly right, it worked. And today, when you're when you're roughly right, things might not work so well. So if we want the, the premium efficiency, we're buying a premium efficiency product and we want it to actually be efficient and run correctly, we have to do the math. So get the pipes the right size, get the circulator sized right, all that sort of stuff is, is uh, in my opinion, more important than ever. Okay. So and both you, guys, and Bruce, both you guys and Bruce as well, to chime in on this, uh, with ModCon mm -hmm. boilers, I've heard more than one person say, and I think we've discussed this before, said, hey, it, it's going to modulate, right? It's, it's got a, a turndown ratio. It's going to modulate. Why am I worried about oversizing? It's not going to be oversized. I'll stick it in, and, I, I, and I'll just use the same one every time. I know it's big enough. I'll stick it in. It won't ever be oversized. What's wrong with that line of thinking? Well, first of all, there's a financial penalty there, possibly, uh, right? So you might be buying a lot more boiler than you need. So who gets to pay that? Does the contractor pay it out of his pocket or does the homeowner get to pick that up uh, kind of thing, right? Um, if you're in a competitive situation, you might blow yourself out of the water kind of thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. it'll modulate down. And yeah, in the control, we have uh, mechanisms in most of the mostly modern podcasts have a mechanism to limit the firing rate today. So you can turn a 399 into a 220 if you want to. But you're, you're paying more for the boiler. You're putting bigger piping on it. You're putting bigger pumps on it, right? Everything gets bigger. Boiler gets bigger. Everything gets bigger. Air separator, expansion tank, everything starts getting bigger. And so why would you do that if you don't need it? Right. And, it and at some point, too, when you're, with your turndown ratio, once you reach bottom, you can't go any lower. And that's when you start yeah. to get oversized in the mild that conditions. Was, yeah, and that was... That was more prevalent when most things were five to one, six to one. Now we're at 10 to one. So things really ratchet back pretty far. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things, some, some of the boilers and depending where you are, especially on LP gas, um, they can get a little finicky down on the low end all the time. You know, so there's, there's some things there too. So setup of that boiler becomes super critical. Get the combustion analyzer out again and get right. Right. Uh, so it takes us back to Bruce's conversation of earlier that um, if you're going to be running on the low end all the time, you better make sure that low end is in spec. Right. And yet, the other thing too is you, you sell someone a 10 to 1 turn down ratio boiler, but it's too big. It's way too big. They only get a 5 to 1. Right? Yeah, you're back to a 5 to 1. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly which is, right. Okay. It's like, that's like selling, I'm going to sell you a set of golf clubs, but I'm only going to give you half of them. Yeah. You know? They're not a consumer yeah. in the world that say, okay, that's fine by me. It doesn't work that yeah, way. You, you, got, you got 13 in the bag, but you can only use six. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I get it all the time. And the big thing with that, too, that I see is, um, you know, you the guys buy a 399 and put a 399 in a house that needed a, a 150 kind of thing. Um, but then the piping is scaled to a 150 instead of a 399. So, you know, there's all sorts of disparities that you see. Um, so they understood that the house didn't need to move that much energy. So they put little pipes and then they, you know, they put a great big heat engine behind it, mm. yeah, you know? So that, that goes back to the whole thing. Do the math. The first part of the math, in my opinion, is do the heat loss, right? Do the heat loss, select the right boiler for the job, not just a, a cookie cutter approach. And then hey, I got uh, a, and build up there. I got an analogy from the 70s, and some of you can appreciate this. Remember when uh, they were putting big V8s and little uh, Chevy Vegas and, and Ford Pentos, yeah. and it could actually <laughs> pop wheelies with them, you know? That's kind of what you got with that big horsepower, and you don't really even need it, you know? So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. The only thing I remember from the yeah, 70s is the, the I'm a pepper, he's a pepper, she's a pepper. Wouldn't you like to be a pepper, too, commercials? <laughs> yes. And it bothers me that I still don't know that, John. Oh, God, I miss you, man. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, so, okay, hey, Ricky, and you one, mentioned the car. Oh, sorry, John. Go ahead. 
No, no, go ahead, Dan. All right, so you mentioned the car. Now, for those of you guys that know me, I'm a big car buff. I don't have a car anymore that, I, you know, race car, but I've got my car shirt on, my Route 66 shirt. So when I hear car analogies, I get all goosed up because then I can <laughs> common sense approach and talk to the audience about their car. So a boiler, oversizing a boiler would be like, hey, I need to change a motor on my lawnmower because it broke. So if I got an 8.75 Briggs and Stratton, I'm not bolting on a 327 Chevy engine that can turn the blades faster. That'd be you fun as hell. <laughs> yeah, it would be fun. It'd, be, it'd, go, it'd go quick. Yep. But like I said, you got to match your components in the system now. So as Tim mentioned earlier, the cast iron system was a little more forgiving. Today, the system matching is critical to match the components. And then one thing Tim mentioned about the combustion, going back to my car story, when Weill McLean or any, man, any boiler manufacturer test fires a boiler at the factory, it's on a set length of pipe or a set length of vent. When you take your straight six out of your, out of your 69 Camaro and put a big block in, I know you don't touch the exhaust. <laughs> and the whole audience starts laughing. Yeah. All right. So you've got to, you took the boiler out of the box, you put it in another environment than it was tested at. You've got to tune the boiler to the exhaust. It's as simple as that. Air's coming in, exhaust is pushing out. You've got to tune that boiler to your exhaust system. Okay. So be mindful of why you're tuning it, why you're doing a combustion analysis. You want to make sure first it's running right. And if you're if you're really good and really quick and pay attention to the detail, when you come back the following year to do your your first year of maintenance and take a look at the system, the first thing you want to do is what? What's the first thing we do, Tim? When we walk in that boiler room. Take your readings again and compare them to the year before. There yeah. you go. Yep. So if your readings are if your readings are close to what you left last year, you know that heat exchanger burning properly you know you got good combustion and your heat exchanger is not dirty if your readings are way off you got to ask yourself hey i'm a man of common sense why am i off after 12 months what happened to the system so is my you know is I, what's going on here and then you got to start looking at the system itself okay? that brings us to, i got a question uh, on those same lines for bruce what can cause that i mean water quality could certainly play an issue what kind of things could cause the combustion efficiency of a, of a ModCon boiler to fall off in 12 months? Uh, well, first off, just the cleanliness of the, of the boiler inside, you know, the that probably goes back to the fuel you're using. Uh, if you haven't uh, tuned the boiler correctly, now the, 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 boi the, the, the boiler is going to start getting dirty inside. That's going to affect your efficiency. Uh, one of the one of the, the uh, biggest lies that was ever told was, "Oh, this is gas; doesn't need service. Go just put it in and walk away." <laughs> right? Boy, was that a big lie? They need service <clears throat> every year. And I used to show pictures of of mod cons that hadn't been serviced in say three or four years, and they were pretty ugly. So that's going to throw everything. The water quality is a whole a whole different issue. Uh, I'd love to talk about that too because that is still a big a, a big problem. If I if I got five minutes, go ahead, uh, do it. Maybe, well, um, first off, you have to understand what's out there in in our systems. We have all these old systems. Uh, you had cast iron boilers. You had copper, steel, brass, cast iron. Multiple uh, metals, a lot of different different uh, different types of metals that were put together, which of course caused corrosion. And the corrosion lived in the bottom of those cast iron boilers. And it was never a problem with those boilers. It was, you know, we had mud legs on boilers, and it, it lived down there in the bottom of the boilers, and it was fine. It didn't bother anybody. We had 007 pumps, and that stuff that was floating around the system didn't bother them either. Well, those boilers came out. The systems remain the same. Everything north of the, the cellar was still the same as it always was. And now we put these little boilers in, then instead of having 12 gallons of water in them that have 
maybe a gallon and a half or two. Uh, no place for all this crap to go. And what we learned early on is plated out inside the boilers, restricted the passages, and ended up killing the boilers fairly early. Uh, you know, and you're talking less than 10 years, those early uh, mud cons. If we're going back, how long have they been out there? Like more than 20 years now. This is 20, yeah. 20 but, so it's more than 20 years. So the early ones, yeah, roughly so 20. Yeah, well, 1997, maybe, was that? Is that right? Or 96? Was it? That'd be the monitor was the first one I remember. I mean, not including like the Paloma packs and stuff like that, but oh, the monitor. Oh, Paloma packs was the 80s. Yeah, that yeah. Was, yeah was you're talking the 80s there. there. Yeah, and then Hyper the Hyper Pulse. Pulse. Yeah, they said Hyper in Pulse. unison, yeah. <laughs> but I, AKA I, the Buzz Bomb. I think the first uh, real European mod car that came in was the Munchkin. And mm -hmm. uh, a lot of lessons, obviously, were learned with that type that type of boiler. Well, the technology has changed uh, a bit now, so that the boilers are a bit more forgiving as far as the water quality, but the water quality is still an issue with everything else. It's, it's an issue with, with, with the circulators, with ECM uh, circulators. Uh, uh, today, an uh, 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 absolute necessary component is a magnetic filter. You know, you can, you can clean your system, you can clean it, uh, use a, a good chemical that clean clean the system out, but the system itself is still going to manufacture corrosion. It, it can't help it. That's what it does. So you you can make it go away with a magnetic filter. And uh, Taco has one now. Taco has a, a magnetic separator. How about that? <laughs> John just might happen to have one nearby that he can hold up. But uh, that's something new that uh, I don't know how new that is. It wasn't, Taco didn't have it when I was uh, still there in 17. I left in 17. But uh, but that is, to me, that is an absolute necessary component. Uh, look at that. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful it thing. It is. One of the simplest ones out there. Yeah. The dirt mag separator, 4900 dirt mag separator. Yeah. And uh, it's an absolute necessary component. I mean, it's, you, you're going to be putting in anything today. Well, I guess if you're putting in a cast iron boiler, you know, you know, it's, you know, fine, you know, you're, you're back to old technology, but if you're putting in anything new today, any of any today's equipment, that is a, a, an absolute necessity. Uh, make the stuff go away because it's going to keep regenerating itself. Uh, that was a, an issue that was pretty near and dear to my heart uh, when I was training. And I saw that as early on as a, a real real ongoing problem that I thought with those early boilers was, was going to really create a lot of a lot of headaches for people and, and it did. Uh, we've learned a lot of lessons in these past few years, but uh, I think that the less that these these stories still need to be told. We still need to tell people and keep hammering away that this is a this is a situation that is not going to change and but we have the equipment, the tools to deal with it. Yep. Very good. All right, got some questions here. Here's one from Bruce Hiller. Uh, what's the best way to stage a redundant boiler into a system? Set the second one at a lower set point in case number one faults, or the same set point, close couple T to set up set up usually. So the best way to stage a redundant boiler. I like that. I'm sure this person. This I'm sure sure Bruce zones with circulators too. I like this. <laughs> um, so I guess the question actually makes me come up with a couple of questions. So we're talking about doing a multiple boiler system, right? Um, and how do we bring the second boiler in? So if it's uh, if it's a modern modcon, most everything has the logic in the onboard control to manage multiple boilers. And most of them offer you two or three options. So you can do sequential. So when boiler one runs out of horsepower, go to boiler two, et cetera, et cetera, which is kind of the old school thing we've always done. That was the, you know, the early tech more stuff and all that, right? Um, and then some of them have parallel, which means that as a boiler reaches a certain point, usually around 30 or 40% modulation, it brings the second boiler on at a much, now at a much reduced rate. So now both 
particulars are starting to simmer along at 10 or 15 percent modulation and they work up together uh and then the other thing that's out at least that we do at Wild McLean is we do it uh smart sequencing so we actually have logic in our control to let the control decide whether it thinks sequential or parallel is better on that particular day based on loads in in a rough sense it's a little more sophisticated than that but in a real you know a real 40,000 foot view um so the kind of the old school thinking of setting setting the aquastats at two different temperatures might still apply to some cast iron product if you don't want to put a, a tecmar or, or a heat timer or something on the wall but um most of the modern stuff has got it all cooked into the recipe already and that's a that's a huge step forward really it, technologically speaking if you think about it i mean that's that all that stuff is yep. done for us automatically it's it's not plug and yeah. play i hate the term plug and play because it never really is but this it is never really is. is yeah our stuff our stuff for example uh runs eight boilers without any extra controls hmm. and if you want to get crazy with it you can put them in banks and start to you know uh the only the masters in each bank talk to each other and then you can start to have multiples you could go nuts with it if you really wanted to mm. yeah and, uh, and, and john like, allen had, if, if we wanted to get simple use the pc 702 you know if you, you had yeah. a cast iron boiler yeah. system out there and Real you simple. had two cast iron boilers pc 702 plugged into a expandable relay it's going to get you that yeah. two boiler lead lag uh rotate stage you know out of that too yes again yeah, yeah, I, I, I can't i can't give iWorks a plug anymore but <laughs> yeah, um, I works can sure you can <laughs> that iWorks had an awesome boiler control mm -hmm. that thing it was called a blmc and that was a great boiler control hey bruce yeah, tim, you, sorry tim you mentioned the uh, multiple boiler systems uh, John, they've even got to start, you know, sophisticated as you can put a 70,000 BTU boiler next to a 3 million BTU boiler in any combination of boilers we sell. And all eight of those boilers will lead leg and rotate hmm. simply through the wizard. You don't even have to do any more additional setups. I would think the 3 million BTU boiler would kind of pick on the little 70,000 BTU guy. Just <laughs> get out of here, squirt. <laughs> <home to mama. laughs> right, but for whatever reason, if you would do that, I don't know why, but... You know, it's a very easy setup now as far as the controls go. Very good. Bruce, you got a message here from Jeff House, and it has to do with this guy. You remember the Takeo Train the Trainer where we came up with the dirt mag separator seven years ago. Do you remember what you called it? Um, let me think now. Um, I remember. <laughs> it was, yeah, uh, big. Oh, God, what was that? That was... It was really funny too. It was a it was a good line. It was the BSR. BSR, right? That was. Mm -hmm. Remember that? What, what did that stand for? Oh. oh. <laughs> you can tell Bruce is retired. Yeah. It's, it's so <laughs> I, but I don't remember. I was there too, and I don't remember either now. So. Oh, you don't remember there either? I remember Rah, it, but I don't remember it. Yeah. When Ra and I came up with that, that was. The, Oh my God! Yes, I. I... All right, help yeah. me out. What was it? Uh, Jeff got it. It was the black shit remover. <laughs> <laughs> and, and lo and behold, now we now we have one. <laughs> yeah, we don't call it that though. <laughs> no, I I think we should. I would love it if we did. It's, you know, it's coming back. It's coming back. I'm working on a new presentation right now. There we go. The BSR. Yes. That's BSR. it. <laughs> Anthony remembers too. Anthony was there as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, was, that, was that at the casino? Was that in, in in Minnesota? No, I think that was that was in uh, that was in Colorado. Golden, Colorado. Oh, was that in Colorado? Yeah. Okay. I know yeah. we we were all over the place. We did one in Virginia. Yep. We did the uh, the, the dry casino. That was that was quite an adventure. <laughs> yeah, I remember the the the, 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 the but we but we did it again. The first thing Bruce said to me he says, "Will there be beer there?" <laughs> Well, we had it at a casino in Minneapolis that was that was they didn't have a liquor license, so no one could get a drink. And uh, yeah, Bruce was not a happy guy. <laughs> well, we found a way. It was just like the old college days. We found a way to sneak it in. So. 
<laughs> uh, okay, we got a, a, um, a question or note from Nick. Uh, John and crew, thank you for the training. I have a property management company and have to deal with heating companies. In 30 years, I have not found one who will do the necessary calculations. And most look at me strangely when I say combustion analysis. I may not be an expert, but I can speak intelli intelli intelligibly. intelligibly. You all have a PhD in heating, proper heating design. Well, thank you, Nick. That's very cool. And that, <laughs> I, that's that's it's sad that 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 that, that 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 that's that's the reality of what you're dealing with. I mean, and, and quick view, quick uh, review from the from the six of us here, and and you guys out there in the real world, um, is this is this common? I mean, is it? Uh, I always ask people, you guys in training classes, how many of you do boi do heat loads for boiler replacements? three two maybe of 30 people in a class is that about right in terms of experience i'm not saying is that right that it is that's the way it should be is that right in, in that is your experience i think yeah, it's based so, on the size of the company you know if you got a, a, a pretty good sized company you actually employ somebody to do heat loss calculations for you uh, you know on an everyday basis you, you're going to see it done a lot more if you got one guy running the company with a couple trucks He's going to be, he's going to tend to be the one that says, man, I just, I don't have time, but this has worked for me for the last 25 years. I'm going to just do it. And that, that's yeah. what I experience. Well, uh, let me put it to you, you know, this way, you know, the, those of us that are on here right now, this is our job, meaning that we get to do training all day, day in, day out. Have we trained everybody? If we did, we'd no. be sitting around not doing anything right now. So, <laughs> Um, and, you know, and unfortunately, there's a lot that don't come to the, to the classes. So, Nick, my suggestion to you for, for some of your guys, go find a couple, you know, a handful of, of your best ones and and send them over to take away after dark. You know, the yeah. recorded sessions um, and send them to the boiler guys and send them to, you know, to everybody else out there so they can they can see this stuff and, and say, hey, you know what? It makes sense for me to do that. You know, um, you know, we were saying, you know, um, I, I remember this a bunch of years ago when I started at Takeo, one of my first training classes in the new training center. And I had a couple of guys in the room and we asked them, why did you come down here today? Why did you decide to spend uh, two days and hang out in Rhode Island? And I remember one guy in the room and he said to me, well, I want to make sure that I'm sizing my systems properly. I want to do the math and, you know, um, for so many years, you know, I grab a 007 and three quarter inch pipe and it does darn near everything. The guy right next to him says, the reason why I came here today, because I need to eliminate the darn near. Because, hmm. yes, that's true. The 007 and three quarter inch pipe does almost everything. But the darn near costs me money because I have to go back and figure it out. I have to go back to the job site. So that's the important part. So I would say, Nick. Get to your guys and talk to them about the darn nears, because yeah. if they have darn nears that they have to worry about, then they're losing money. Even though, as Rick was just saying, hey, I don't have the time to do it. Well, imagine not having the time when you don't when you don't know what the heck is going on either. So those are some of the things I think about, too. Bruce, you've been in this longer than all of us. Uh, what have you seen changing in that respect from back when you were a younger guy and had your own company to, 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 to later in your career in terms of guys wanting to know how to do stuff? Has that changed? Um, well, the technology has, has, has gotten ahead of people. So it's, it's, it's become a necessity. Uh, back when I was in, in the business, when I was in the field and I was talking the seventies, we didn't, we didn't even have phones. We had beepers back then. And I had a bookcase behind my driver's seat in my van that had, technical manuals. I mean, that was all I had. Uh, there was no place to call. I didn't, there was nobody to call. If I needed help, there wasn't anybody. Uh, yeah. It just, that's the way it was back then. Figure it out. I, yeah. I knew a few manufacturers reps and, you know, a couple of really great guys that uh, unfortunately are no longer with us that uh, helped me out a lot when I was a young guy still learning. But we had nothing back then like we have today. The resources that we have today are incredible. And I mean, you just absolutely from what we're doing right now and what we've been doing all these years. Uh, what I found is that I was preaching to the choir a lot. You know, we, I was I, I see a lot, a lot of times the same people, the same faces would come to, to the training classes. And, Free lunch. 
and it's like, you know, where's the rest of the guys? You know, the, those are the ones that need it, and they're, they're not the ones that show up. And it, I don't know what the answer was. I don't know what it is today. I don't. I didn't know what it was then. How do you get people to, to, to come out and learn? Uh, John, you used to say I, I, there was a percentage, I think, uh, 5 or 10 percent uh, show up, and then the rest of them, you, you've got... Uh, oh, how how did you put it? It was it was like a triangle. Do you remember that that you had oh, yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah. the cream of the crop at the top, and then you got the guys in the middle that were oh, yeah, okay, and then there's the ones down the bottom that never ever show up, and those are the ones that we really need to get. Yeah, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's and the base of the triangle is the biggest one. Yeah. Like Maslow's hierarchy. And Ooh. again, too. like Maslow's hierarchy, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Anybody that's taken any psychology classes, a little bit about Maslow, right? Same idea. Uh, you know, it's interesting what the guys miss is that, and this is in every every walk of our industry, whether you work at a manufacturer, a rep agency, uh, you're a contractor, or you're a guy at the wholesale counter, what you miss is that if you're not the trusted advisor, mm -hmm don't have the knowledge and the skills and, and you're not the trusted advisor, all you got left is price. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And the other guy's yeah. got a pencil and an eraser too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know? on. yeah. And it's just a race to the bottom. Yeah. You know, if you can go in and, and, uh, and you can impress upon the homeowner that, Hey, there's a science to this. And by the way, I know the science and I'm going, it and give you the best system possible maybe you get a little more money for your work you know or you eliminate some of the competition if we don't raise the bar if you look at the hydronics industry we haven't gained share as an industry against the warm air guys in in any of our lifetimes no and it's not going to happen either and part of it is because we don't do the damn math right we're not the trusted advisor right it's a big, right. it's a big deal. Yeah. Nick Sorrento asked, any suggestions for engineers or designers in the Pittsburgh area? Nick, uh, if for engineers to learn learn more about hydronics, I I, I highly recommend uh, 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 our Takeo Tuesdays uh, sessions. Every every two uh, every other Tuesday at noon, we have a we have a one hour webinar, um, and we we do one 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 week. It's it's uh, commercially focused for engineers done by our our, our brilliant and commercial trainers brett zerba and rich medeiros these guys are these guys are tremendous uh, and then every other week it's a it's a residentially focused session that'll be run by myself or dave rick or a combination of all three of us um where we'll do a presentation on more residentially focused stuff but those things go on those those, those go on every other tuesday and you can sign up for them on our website just go to go to takeocomfort.com and just uh, in the search engine, do Takeo Tuesday, and, and you'll be able to get there. And you can sign up for all of them if you want to. Uh, that would be it. And then reach out to to our commercial trainers, and they can set up sessions for uh, for engineering firms, etc. They they, they, that's one of the things that that's that we have done. Uh, I think we got out. Of, I think we really did, did get out ahead of the curve in doing these online presentations. We started mid March. Was it mid March, Dave? Rick? Yeah. And we started doing these things around mid March. Because we saw that, hey, we had a travel ban at Takeo earlier than anybody else. He says, "Well, we, what we do is travel and train. We better get, we better get ready." Um, uh, so, so we started doing, we started w doing webinars. I think well before anybody else. And I think if we were to total it up, we've probably trained close to twenty thousand people since the since mid March. Um, now, some of a lot of your repeats, but twenty thousand is twenty thousand. It sounds better that way. Um, but it, it it shows me a couple things in the, in the new normal, the new world that we're dealing with. Uh, people still want to learn, and maybe this is a good way to supplement face to face training if we ever get back to doing face to face training again. I don't know if that's going to happen. That's not. I've written it off for the rest of this year. I don't think it's going to happen. We'll see what happens in 2021. All right. Yeah. Um, so you know, so that's that's kind of how it goes. Um, 
Uh, Chris Warner asks, can you can you repeat Takeo Tuesdays at night instead of at noon? Actually, we what we do is we we record them and archive them. They're available for view anytime you want on our website. So those are there available to you. So yeah, uh, all you just got to do is Takeo Tuesday. There's a list of exit of, of archived webinars. Just watch whatever you want as many times as you want. So you can you can certainly do that. Zadite. So yeah, and again, like like these things, they're all recorded and we store them on our website. We got they're they're everywhere. I mean, boy oh boy. Uh, we've got a we've got a library of re recordings that I think is 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 massive because we've been doing that we've been we've been doing webinars webinars in general since 2010 I think um, but we really went into overdrive this year like everybody else did. Is that right? Is that right? Yeah, well, we got a couple of other couple of other good comments here. Uh, but boom, boom, boom. What do we got? What do we got here? Uh, okay. We have, we must sell radiant cooling and radiant heating as the healthy form of climate control over forced air. Knowledge is power. Uh, Tim, you probably know more about radiant cooling than anybody else I know. What, uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So, yeah, I was one of the knuckleheads that kind of brought radiant cooling into the North American market, right? Um, one of the challenges is residentially, it's very difficult. And it's difficult residentially because we can't control the container, right? So the house, uh, there's too many variables. Does little Johnny leave his window open? Does, does, you know, does somebody go out and leave the back door open on a warm day? Um, how do we control that? And uh, of course, radiant cooling, the, the big concern is humidity and moisture, right? Condensation. So commercially, most commercial buildings, we have better control over the container. Um, we don't have operable windows, things like that, right? Um, you know, we have uh, uh, automatic doors and, and things like that. We have locks coming into the buildings or uh, those kinds of things are already there, right? It's part of the, it's part of the norm. So the container is much easier to control the things that can make our radiant floor look bad, right? That uh, kind of thing. Residentially, it's and you're only going to get, you're only going to pick up depending on floor coverings and all those kinds of things. You might pick up 10 to 12 BTUs a square foot of cooling. Um, that would be driving the surface down quite low. So again. <clears throat> what do we do to control humidity in that space and, and deal with the latent load, right? So yeah. probably not practical for, for residential. Maybe, you know, large, you know, the starter castles kind of thing. Maybe they can afford to do some things, but average residential, it's pretty tough. Yeah, it is. Uh, 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 we, that question <clears throat> used to come up every radiant class we ever did. Was, can I run chilled water and then do air conditioning and then I've got both licked? Well, yeah, but no. I mean, you, you got to deal. You know, Rich McGrath says you got to deal with the dew point. You got to remove humidity. I mean, air conditioning really is a big dehumidifier anyway. You know? Yeah. Yeah. If it's size, you know, the, the key to air conditioning is getting the getting the water out of the air first. If you leave the water in the air and drop the temperature, it's not going to be a very comfortable space. And it's going to be very wet too. <laughs> yeah, it gets a little little sticky. Yeah. A little, um, little bit. Radiant cooling's pretty pretty tough residentially. Yeah, and uh, uh, Jeff House mentioned the Lorax principle, and this goes back to I think what, this was one when Rick first got the nickname the Lorax. So I don't know. You guys all know. Take take a good look at Rick. He, he's the Lorax, right? Where's the you got the Lorax right behind you, Dave? Bring bring Mr. Lorax. Bring bring stuff Ricky up here. <laughs> Do you see the do you see <laughs> the connection? Comb that mustache. <laughs> Sorry, it's in his eyes there. Yes. There you yeah. go. Rick, Rick okay, as far as we're concerned, is the Lorax. Okay. And the reason Rick is the Lorax is is this quote from the Lorax that Jeff House just typed in. Uh and and Jeff was I I mean I remember seeing the Lorax as a kid, but Jeff really applied it to our industry beautifully. And I, I'll never forget you. I'll never I'll I'll always appreciate you for that. Jeff, because it really got me to think. Uh, and, and the quote is, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to change. It's not. So we keep, I, I guess this is, circle back to our conversation a little bit earlier. We keep saying, well, the industry has to change. Well, bullshit. The industry's not going to change. Industries don't change. People change, right? Yeah, right. One at a time. 
you know, and it says, well, what if I do this and nobody else does it? Well, who the hell cares? You're doing it, right? You got to do what's yes. right. You've got, and if you do what's right and it works and then someone else might see, hey, he's doing it right. Maybe I should do what he's doing. And then another person and then another person. But you're not going to change the industry. You change the people. You change people one at a time. And and we don't change people. You know, you, people change themselves. People see that this is maybe a better way. Maybe there's new learning, you know. One of the things in our, in our train the trainer classes, we said it's very difficult to change someone's mind, but you can help them reach a new conclusion by giving them new information. And that's really where 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 this whole thing starts to roll. So yeah, don't don't worry about changing the industry. Do you the best way you know how. You're not going to throw away your shot, right? You knew I'd work that in. You knew I'd work that in. All right, don't throw away your shot. It's 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 it, you can't control what anybody else does. All right? You can't control what anybody. I, I forget who who said it first, but uh, somebody said it first. It's, it's something I've heard different people say over the years. But the only thing you can control in life is you know your thoughts and your attitude, and your well your attitude and your and your effort. Those are the only things you can control. Everything else is out of your control. So don't worry about what everybody else is doing. It may cause grief. You may lose a job to some chucklehead. It's gonna happen, right? You can't you can't idiot proof yourself. The world is you can't idiot proof things. Why? The world is full of really really motivated idiots, right? You know you you can't they, they, they're there. You just do. We make best. new ones every day. Exactly, exactly. It's like it's like they have continuing education hours for idiots. You know. Yeah. Get professional development hope credit. <laughs> Best we can hope for is idiot resistant. That's right. You gotta be. You can't be idiot proof. You gotta be idiot resistant. <laughs> and you know, McGrath and, says and idiots going, just get more creative. <laughs> you know, and, and going back to my my comment about learn the math, become the trusted advisor. Um, there's a lot of money to be made cleaning up after idiots. Oh yeah. boy, yes, yes. So you don't have to be the first guy on the job. Sometimes it's better to be the second guy. Right. <laughs> Number two. Right. Yeah. Number two. Yeah. Probably yeah, make right. more money too. <laughs> Cleaning up. That's right. Yeah, you, you get as much that. money to clean up the install as the guy got for doing the install. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. Yep. I've been there, been there and done that. Yep. Yeah. Well, just I just don't. I was going to say, just don't volunteer to be the expert witness on the lawsuit to try to get their money back. Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Avoid that at all costs. Yes, 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 yes. I can't, yeah, do not, be, do not be the forensic expert, right? Mm -mm, no, I, I can remember a, working at a manufacturer's rep in Boston, your, your old okay, competitor, Bruce. And uh, I got a call from a homeowner who said that uh, she wanted me to tell her what the original installer did wrong with their boiler install so they could sue the original installer. I said, well, I, I really can't do that. A, I'm not qualified. B, you know, that guy who did the original installation is, is, is my customer. I mean, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, so well, what do I do? I said, I hire a consulting engineer and have them them do it and then take it from there. He says, well, I don't want to pay an exorbitant fee. Well, I don't know if the fee is exorbitant or not, but <laughs> you know, yeah. you're talking to the wrong person here. <clears throat> and we live in a litigious society and that's just the way it is, but it was, it was an interesting discussion. Yeah, that's not a good position to be in. Mm -mm, definitely not, definitely not. All right, well, boy, we still got 60 guys out there. This is how this thing goes, right? This is how this thing goes, For, you know, we. You know, a few guys leave, a few more guys leave, but we still got 60 people asking questions and making comments. And Anthony Rika, who was also at the, the Golden Colorado Train the Trainer, along with Jimmy De Palma, the French Knight. Um, though that's got to stick forever, Jimmy. I'm sorry. That the French Knight is going to stick forever. Uh, but a uh, Anthony Rika says, I tried the eat it vaccine once and it didn't work. <laughs> yeah, that's you, you just as you, you as it uh, Chris Warner said, you can't fix stupid. You can't fix the person who did the stupid, but you can fix what the stupid person did. And that's like what you guys are saying. You can make a lot of money fixing what stupid people do. Yep. Sometimes it's good to be the number second guy through the door. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially when they call you up and say, hey, that price you gave me originally, is that still good? Oh, hell no. It's <laughs> yeah. gone up a little bit. <laughs> All bets are off the table. Yep. <laughs> Uh, it, it was, ignorance is repairable. Stupidity is forever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that that is true. That's very very true. That's that's very true. 
All righty, guys. What else? Anything? What else? You guys want to talk about? Bruce, what's what? What? How are you keeping busy in retirement? Uh, well, you know, there's always something going on in the house. Uh, there's always the little things to fix around the house. But uh, I spend a lot of time in the in the land yacht. Yeah, you know about the land yacht. Oh yeah. yes, yes. RV. It's about 37 feet, and uh, it's got everything you can imagine in it. So we uh, we were down at the Outer Banks uh, back in July. We went and spent uh, 10 days down there, which was great. We had a wonderful time, and uh, you know, just uh, kind of enjoying it. Right now, we're we don't have anything planned until Labor Day, but we're doing bike riding. We uh, we went for a 20 mile bike ride a couple of days ago. And, you know, and in, in, even in all the heat, but still trying to stay active and trying to stay healthy. And, uh, you know, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. I am not going to get sick. So very I, good. I am not going to get sick. So I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do and and uh, following all the rules and stuff. You know, and that's and 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 enjoying life. Uh, it's, uh, I'm loving it. Loving it. Absolutely loving it. So. Very good. Well, you 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 definitely earned it, and you deserve a good retirement. You did a lot of good for the industry, Bruce, over the years, and uh, I was proud to know you. Know, I was very 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 proud to be at your last class. That was a oh, that was I, I was I was I was. It's a good thing I'm tougher than six roofing nails. Otherwise, I would have got a little weepy right at the very end. I, did uh, you give I, it I, I was looking, John. I, I was, I was sweat. Picture. It was sweat. It wasn't tears. It was. I it was, was looking at that picture <laughs> just a couple of days ago of that that that, that class and. It was it was a, that was a good one. It was a really good group. It was a small group. I think there was only like a, a dozen people in there, but uh, it was a it was a really good. It was one of the best I I'd, I'd ever done. It was, and it was the last one. There you go. No, November seventeenth. Yep, that was a great that was a great day. I was very I, proud to be there. I you know what I always enjoyed it. I, it was a lot of fun all those years. I loved what I did. I absolutely loved it. Uh, it's it's passing on knowledge, and I think I uh, in Chicago, uh, you, you recall you were there uh, when when I got that that award. Uh, right. Yeah. And I said that it, you know if you can make a difference in somebody's life, you've succeeded. If you can make any difference in somebody's life, and I, I think I did. I think I, I you know and I, I tried to do that. I tried to pass on what I knew and help people, and and just uh, it, it was a great ride. I loved it. I miss it. I, I do miss it somewhat. Uh, you know, I, I do. I, I love what I did, but it was time. Yes, yeah. it was time. Well, we can we can keep you busy with a webinar too every once in a while. It's, yeah, it's, yeah I, I, I'm happy to do this. So you know, anytime you know you 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 got a you got a carte blanche. Anytime you call, I'm there. <laughs> All right, everybody heard that, right? Everybody heard that. <laughs> you can't back out now. Good. Uh, now I will tell you the one. <laughs> <laughs> the session you did on combustion analysis. We had a take out Tuesday on combustion analysis that Bruce did, and and it was wonderful. And I think we had about seven hundred people on the line that day. It was it was nuts. Nice. Very good. Now, Tim, you've got, you've been doing some training too, right? Yeah, we just did a couple things. I just did one for the Eastern Energy Expo, the, some of their virtual stuff, and uh, doing a lot of small stuff, right? One on one with contractors and mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to keep the wheels on and keep helping people to succeed in these very strange times. So yeah, a lot of virtual, a lot of virtual trainings, little stuff here and there. Um, and we did uh, Wa McLean did Wa McLean Wednesdays, so we we kind of copied what you were doing. We did it went mid Wednesdays, and and we had a bunch of things going on with that. That just ended, and now we're we're doing some regional stuff now. So yeah, we got a bunch of things going on, and uh, you know if there's something out there somebody wants, uh, you know wants some help on or whatever, just uh, just sing out. We'll figure out how to do it for you. Terrific, terrific, and and Rick and Dave, you guys are you get we're all well. All three of us are keeping pretty busy. Uh, we're not going at the April May pace that we were, but it's still that's going to pick up. I think that's going to pick up. Oh, what, yeah. what, what, what kind of special stuff have you guys been up to? Oh, it's just been a, a little bit here and there. I mean, mostly I've been spending a lot of time at the uh, with OESP and and setting that together. So I've been working on that and. Um, and just 
you know, just putting the mind share for what the fall is going to bring. I think that's mm-hmm. what I need to do now is really put the mind share to what the rest of the year is going to look like. I mean, my wife asked me yesterday, do I miss getting out on the road? And I said, oh, yeah, definitely. You know, being able to, I mean. Wrong answer. Wrong answer. <laughs> How was the couch? I did say, I did follow Wrong up, though, answer. saying that oh, this this kind of platform is now added to the repertoire of, of training now. So where it's an accepted form. So I will still be doing online training classes. I believe this is not going to go away because in the past, I mean, you know, we've been doing webinars for years. Now it's accepted form of -hmm. training where a lot of people shied away from it. They didn't want to get involved in it. Now more people say, Hey, you know what? The tech isn't that hard. It is actually quite easy as we can tell by, you know, take away at the dark, you know, right. by putting together what is this? Uh, say, uh, I don't even know how many sessions we did. So, um, you know, I, and so, oh no, she wants me out of the house. Hell yeah, <laughs> I've been home too long. Yeah, you know, and, and let's, let's face it, we wouldn't, we wouldn't do what it is that we do if we didn't enjoy getting out and, and meeting the people and working with the people and yep. and help them along and and them helping us along too. Right, because I don't know about you guys, but I learn from my from my customers and Me too. and uh, all the time. So it's um it's important. We got to figure out how to get back out and get with people at some point. But this is just another tool in the toolbox now for us, right? That's the way we're looking at it. Yeah. Uh, one thing one, that's that's the way I'm looking at it, right? A, mm-hmm. Another foot in the gun, if you would, you know. There you go. Well, one th- one thing I've noticed is t- it's twofold. I, I know just based on looking at the first ones we did to now, I mean, as, it, as, as trainers, I think we've all gotten better at training using this, this new electronic tool. There's a, there's, it, it's not just getting up and talking. You've got a, there's a way to do a webinar to be effective and you can do, you can do really crappy webinars. I've seen a bunch of them, you know, where by, you know, two minutes into it, you want to check Facebook and by five minutes, you, you know, you're, you're kind of brain dead. So, right. you know, the, there are plenty of those, plenty of things like that. I think as an industry or as a team anyway, I know we've gotten a lot better at using this technology to present effectively. And the, the other side of that is I think the audience, you guys out there watching this have gotten better at learning this way because that's not easy. Sitting here and listening to a, a webinar right. isn't easy stuff because it's just a bunch of talking heads, you know? So it, it, you guys have gotten really good at learning this way. So we've both come a long way, I think, uh, in making this a better way, uh, 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 making better use of this technology. I still don't, I don't think this is a better way to train than face-to-face in person, but it's what we got now, you know, for the foreseeable right. future. Horse so head. Right. Good at it. Right, and yes. John, somebody asked, somebody asked me, I'm not gonna, someone asked me, I'm not going to tell you who, but they're like, why do you sit every Wednesday evening and listen to Takeaway After Dark? And you guys know I've been on since what the second one. Oh yeah. And I said to my, I said to myself, all right, listen. I know Dave. I know Rick. You know, and I know John. You've all been at the Michigan City Wild McLean, uh, you know, School of Better Heatings, and you've all come to the auditorium and you know picked up on where I stopped with my discussion. So when I first started talking about circulators, now. John has really good words like the boiler boiler rates and the circular circulates, you know, that kind of stuff. So I pick up on little things and I have some fun. Now you guys know I have fun. You know, evening wear is like this shirt and stuff like that, kind of like, you know, Dave stuff. And you gotta have fun with it. But if I can pick up one little nugget, one little piece of information, something that makes sense to me that I can use my what is this, John? What is this? I can't see it. Where am I at? Japan, your, your your knowledge transfer device. Thank you. See, now I learned knowledge transfer stick from John about the first <laughs> week I was with Wild McLean five years ago. He showed me the Crayola uh, pump curve, and I just zoned out. I was like, wow, what is that? So I just started with the 007, right, guys? Yep. I do the 007, 007E, and I said, when the Takeo guys get here tomorrow at 11 a.m. or 12, whatever their hour slot is, they will pick up on that conversation. So I try to keep it simple, logical, and don't get too crazy. But I do ask basic questions. Now, Bruce, you talked about water treatment. When I get into the water treatment part of my discussion, 
and I have to ask the audience, I have to gauge their knowledge of where they're at. Uh, it could be half an hour, 45 minutes or an hour. The first thing I ask them is why do we put antifreeze in the vehicle? So the and, and, and in Chicago, you know, we live in, I live in Chicago my whole life. And I call on Illinois and Indiana. 99% of them say to protect from freezing. And I said, well, if I live in Florida or California, do I care about freezing? No. Well, why do we put the antifreeze in the, in the, in the engine? Because your car is a boiler, an emitter, and a water pump. It's not really a water pump, it's a water circulator, but we call it a pump. So that is a boiler system in your car, and we're used to that. We understand that. We think we understand that. And then they look at me like I got three heads because I'm talking about vehicles. And then they catch on that I'm talking about protecting, you know, multi-metals in a system from corrosion. Now, us, let's say, aged guys on the call when i used to open up my 66 pontiac catalina 389 radiator you'd open it up you'd look in there and you'd look for the white crust remember that on top of the tubes today we don't have crusty white tube radiators because our antifreeze our you know corrosion protection the uh medium is the antifreeze that has gotten so much better over the years mm -hmm. right and you guys know i had that stp bottle of antifreeze that's probably 20 years old and it says two year protection. And I've got my Prestone bottle that's about nine years old. And that says uh, 150,000 five year. And magically two years ago, the lifetime of a star appeared on the Prestone bottle. I don't know where it came from, but it can't be lifetime. So then I always talk about, look at the box, read the instructions and everyone's laughing, but then they all catch on that you've got to look at each component and you have to understand why it's there. If you don't know why, then you don't know. It's as simple as that. Does that make sense? Hey, Absolutely. Dan. I, I learned a long time ago how to make antifreeze. How do you do that? Hide your nightgown. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> now, my, my old man used to tell me, my, my old man used to tell me a lot of things. You know, stop touching that was one, you know. What the hell's wrong with you was another. Um, <laughs> one thing, he, one thing he told me uh, I'll never forget is, you know, that, it, you know, knowing knowing how is good, but knowing why is better, because those who know how will always work for those who know why, and that's that's kind of always stuck with me over the years, you know, um, along with what the hell's the matter with you? Again, another thing he said to me very, very often, um, you know. So, so, the, but, but that's a, to me, it's you no. Know, a lot of people know how, but, but the. The guy, the the Lorax is among us. Know why? I think that's a yeah. that's, that's something uh, I've tried to live by anyway. Dan, Dan's analogy of the car is it's, it's a great one because when you really think about it, the engine is a boiler, water pump, your heater is is a hydro air system. Yep. So all you're doing is pumping right. radiator uh, system water through a coil and blowing air over it. Uh, it's the same as a, a as a heating system. It's a really great analogy. Very good. Hmm. Yeah. And I really stump them when I ask them if it's a closed system, because uh, I think it was last week or the week prior, you guys talked about pressure reducing valves, right? So when you, when you set your pressure in your system, whether it's 12 PSI, 14, whatever your pressure needs to be for your system, we shut off the incoming water supply and the whole room goes crazy. Oh, you can't do that. If you get a leak, what's going to happen? I said, well, if it was your house, or your mom's house, you'd have a low water cutoff on there, wouldn't you? Of course. Then why don't you put a low water cutoff on your boiler systems for the other people that you take care of? Well, that would cost money. I go, well, what? I mean, I don't understand that. So is your car a closed system or open system? And that that's a, that now we start getting crazy on this one. <laughs> so I asked them, when you drove from the hotel across the street, to the factory, which is 1.2 mile door to door. When you drove, or when you drove here this morning, I did not see a tanker following you into the parking lot with antifreeze, oil, transmission fluid, window washer solvent, power steering fluid, brake fluid, and then they're all staring at me. I go, "You're driving a closed system." So that's what you need to understand. The boiler system has to be a closed system. So I've had a lot of contractors in the Chicago, Indiana, you know, lower Illinois, stare at me like, what is wrong with you? 
I said, nothing. <laughs> I'm just, you're asking me a question and I just asked you right back a nice, a logical question. I need you to understand how this thing works because they've been, one guy's been installing boilers for 30 years. He's never shut off the incoming water supply. Never. But then, mm. you know, the circulator, or, you know, or something goes wrong with the system. And if you get a leak somewhere, you'll little spring, spring a little leak. As you well know, you introduce all that fresh water into the system. Now you're bringing a lot of minerals in and you're damaging all the components in the system. So you want to have a nice built efficient system. But if you start introducing a lot of minerals or, you know, it, it just it just gets way off. And then people don't really understand what that means. So we have these logical conversations now in Michigan City at our distributor training classes that I put on in the auditorium. And I'm also working with you know local distributors in the area. And we could do it for anybody across the country. I'll bring you know contractors in to the auditorium and talk to them too. And then you know talk, talk with everybody and try to build a better common sense logical approach to the system. Because if you're you know you guys remember my little DeWalt race car that I have right on the right on the desk when we start. I say if if the driver pulls into the pit and the right rear tires flat, do not call Ford or Chevy and tell them the engine's bad because the engine's still running. All right. But the boiler system when you know when the system when the, something gets jacked on the system the boiler's still running or the boiler's made to shut off when it hits a certain limit. So you need to understand that. So just trying to understand the whole system has been very complicated for me because I get, you know, people want to call you and yell at you right away. And then, you, you know, especially when you're face to face and you try to solve their, you know, solve their issue through understanding. And then hopefully through some additional training, we can, get them to come out and when you come out to look for a, at a system for the first time one in the boiler room to look at the entire system in the boiler room so john smart our technical uh trainer and uh, technical guy in the field when i first started we went out to look at a boiler in a suburb of chicago out of the boiler it was the wrong size pipe one pipe size too small and from the top of the boiler to the top of the or to the bottom of the first floor or top of the boiler room, there were 1190s, guys, 1190s on a one-inch pipe before that pipe even left the boiler room, and there was no more than six feet of pipe. The guy just didn't <laughs> want to cut it at the floor <laughs> and take all those 90s out. I don't understand what he was doing. And he said to me, it took me like three days to pipe this thing. I didn't want to make additional work for myself. I said, the boiler cannot get the heat out of the boiler. Therefore, it's stopping. Yeah. It's, it's I can't really stuff. repeal the rules of physics here just because you don't want to do any more work. It just doesn't work that way. You right, mentioned right. Logic, so, you mentioned logic, Dan, and I, I got a logic I got a logic uh, item for you. If you've ever heard this, ad hoc ergo propter hoc. How is your Latin, boys? Ad hoc ergo propter hoc. This is a troubleshooter's nightmare. You know what that means? No. It's a, it's a, it's a logical fallacy, and it's in Latin. Uh, ad hoc ergo propter hoc means uh, after this, therefore, because of this. Something happened after something else, therefore, something caused that thing to happen. But it's the fallacy there. It's like, you know, lunch happens before dinner, therefore, lunch causes dinner. Right. And it's that lot, that way of thinking with people in terms of troubleshooting can get them in trouble. So, well, like this <laughs> happened. Then this happened, so it must have been this to cause it. So I'm going to replace that part, and it's not really getting into the thinking. And it, and that that kind of thinking actually applies in a lot of different situations. Um, I've heard you know uh, I, this discussion from a from a very well known person in our industry was saying, well, you know, when when the about about you know the system delta t that the system you know the the system delta t has to get smaller as the as it gets warmer out you know it, it, it in order to deliver btus when it gets warmer we need a, a higher average water temperature to get btus out of a system when it's about 50 degrees outside and that just struck me as really odd uh, I, I guess i'm not explaining this well but he was insisting that it is a very well-known person that the 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 in order for a system to work properly when it gets warmer and warmer out, 
you know, we can't reduce the flow. We have to let the delta T get smaller so we'll get more output out of the baseboard, which seemed very odd to me. A 20 degree delta T is fine to design to when it's minus 10 out, but when it's 55 degrees outside, all of a sudden a, del a, a wider delta T is somehow a bad thing. I never quite understood that. It made no sense to me whatsoever. You know, uh, it, 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 it was when you know, talk when guys who, who didn't think delta T pumping was a good idea. Um, and I, I just, uh, maybe I'm not explaining, you guys tell me, am I explaining it in a way that's understandable? I mean, I know what I mean in here. I'm, you know, I, I think he, he had lost sight of the fact that it's all about BTUs. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's all about BTUs and yet you need less BTUs at 50 degrees than, than, than you needed at, 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 at 20 degrees. Right. And you can achieve that with flow by just slowing the flow down, and the, the delta T will, will do that. Absolutely, will do that. It'll deliver the BTUs that are needed uh, based on the temperature. Uh, we, what do we used to call it? Indoor reset. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and it's it's and it's dealer's choice. You can change the flow or change the temperature. Yeah. Or you can change yeah. both. You can change, you can change both. Yeah. yeah. And you'll get to the same place. Yeah, and then, then the other thing that was totally missed was, you know, a delta T pump has a minimum speed anyway, so you're never going to have a ridiculously low flow rate anyway when it's really warm out. So it just, it, the, but these are some of the things that people were saying that were absolutely true to try to disprove or discredit a concept that that basically was a competitive disadvantage. But I don't want to get into all that nonsense. I think I think well, the that, other that side that goes too. along with the. There used to be a train of thought, and there was a lot of discussion about it many many years ago on the uh, wall, right, when it, fir when it first came out, that um, if you over pump the system, you close the delta T because you're, you're moving more water than design, right? Mm -hmm. And therefore, you couldn't deliver the heat because somehow when it went too fast, the BTUs were afraid to jump off. Eh, come on. Yeah. Wow. But it's yeah. kind of, it's kind of the same it's kind of the same thing, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and that was that was widely believed that if you overpumped the system, the BTUs wouldn't get off the bus. No, as long as there's a delta T, it don't matter. I, there's I, a differential of temperature. The laws of physics tell us that hot has to go to cold. Yep. <laughs> and and oh and God. I studied. I obey the law. <laughs> you know, we obey the law here. We're law we're law abiding people. We all do every day, right? Yeah. Gravity. That's it. <laughs> you know? That's right. If we if we didn't obey the law of gravity, where would we be? I, I think also a lot of people forget <laughs> the word heat loss and what it means. Yeah. It's heat that is lost. So we have to put that heat back in again. Mm. So if I lost it, it's gotta go back in no matter what. Like Tim just said, it's physics. You've got to replace it at an equal rate to the loss. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. So maintain it. And there's a lot that's, of ways to do that. That's the way, that's why I always I refer to houses and buildings as a container. I think somehow people understand better that we have this container and maybe our container that maybe the lid's not on tight, right? So some of the some of the stuff that's inside is going to the outside. And uh and we have to replace that somehow. What do we do? You know, it's kind of that simple. Yeah, maybe to go to to go to one of Dan's analogies. While the, the the heating system is a closed system, the containers potentially an, is is an open system. Absolutely open system. Yeah, sure. Right. That's why we have this weird thing called infiltration. Yeah, yeah. Right, and 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 exfiltration, and these guys these guys run around with this weird thing called a blower door. Yep. And, and measure that right. Yep, that's what we do. It's what we do. All yep. righty. Well, guys, hey, this I was just, a lot of fun. Oh, go I ahead. just realized something, Dan. We kept you away from ice cream night, or is it yeah, still open? Yeah, so listen. I still got ice cream. I got uh, I have uh, dark cherry blue bunny, and I've got Briar's mint fudge swirl. Well, that's Ooh. cheating. You can't yes. eat that at home. You, uh, that's cheating having it at home. You got to go out. Well, you know. Do get out occasionally for that. Hey, Nick, Dan, uh, last last Wednesday, uh, last Thursday, I went to the motherland. I was in Waterbury, Vermont. Went to the Ben and Jerry's factory. Oh, nice. Mm. nice. 
they weren't yeah because of covid no tours unfortunately but they had the ice cream stand set up so had, cherry uh, garcia I had, uh, my buddy had cherry garcia i had some sort of peanut butter nut crunch thing because you know how i am with peanut butter um but it was uh it was it was it was an experience i loved it and now right in my freezer you know what i have I have avocado vanilla bean ice cream. Nice. Or vanilla bean avocado ice cream. I'm on the Tom the Tom Brady diet. Bruce, you'd appreciate that. Yeah. You know, because you know I I eat to win. I don't know about anybody else, but I eat to win. <laughs> what did he have? Avo avocado toast, wasn't that his thing? Avocado. I love avocado toast. I know. You know, just mash it up with some garbanzo beans and some avocado. Mash it up, man. Put it on some toast with a with a tomato slice, maybe a little onion. That's all right. That I've fun. gone vegetarian. I don't know if you guys know that. I've, I've gone vegetarian. Been vegetarian since November. November. No yeah. more paleo diet. No, not I. You know, I should go back to paleo again, but a paleo vegetarian. There's really not much left for you to eat. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's been good. It's been it's been a it's been a good experience. I can't wait to my physical to see what if, if the numbers have gone down to safe levels yet. But you look good, so that's... <laughs> thanks. More important to look good than to feel good. <laughs> well, yes, I you know yeah. feeling good is good, but looking good is even better. You know, so that's all right. Uh, let's see, Jeff House, gentlemen, it has been the best summer school I've ever attended. Thank you, and see you soon as travel permits. Great job. Well, thank you, Jeff. That was a really appreciated. And Gary Scarborough, staying to the end. I've enjoyed the heck out of this summer school. Thank you so much. Nuts and berries paleo as I look out at the forest behind my house. Yeah, that's kind of what you, you, you if you're gonna be paleo and vegetarian, it's nuts and berries. That's about it. And really, you're not supposed to eat too many berries. Too sweet. And you gotta stay with the nuts and what else? And, and raw vegetables. That's about it. Don't even cook them. <laughs> Yeah, Bruce is kind of making a face. No, no, I got it. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm going to stick with my steak. There you go. Well, have I, I have found Beyond Burger, Beyond Beef uh, makes great, really good burgers. I mean, they, it's not a hamburger, you know, you don't expect it to taste like a hamburger, but it's, it's a reasonable substitute. And the Italian sausage that they make is really, really good. And the ground beef, I guess, sort of kind of ground beef is a good substitute for sauces and stuff like that, for pasta sauce. So that there are alternatives. There are alternatives. You just gotta watch, you can't, you gotta watch what you buy because you can't have too much soy. Soy's not necessarily good for you. You're shaking your head too, it ain't gonna happen for you either? No, sir. <laughs> uh, they're complaining about all the cow, the cow flatulence, so I'm trying to kill the cows for them. You're trying to kill the cows and <laughs> take care of cow flatulence, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want the cows farting all over the place, messing things up. So I'll keep eating the cows. All right, you do, you do, you do, you do your part for the environment. I love you, man. That's great. Yeah, I am. I'm an environmentalist. Yep, that's right. They're, 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 and those, you know, what those cows do? They kill grass. They eat grass. You know? Yeah. Yeah. His his food eats yeah, your food. Taking, <laughs> yeah, they're eating your food, John. <laughs> yeah, that's right, man. Wait a minute. <laughs> it's competition. So. So see that I'm not only am I helping the environment, I'm helping you too. Oh, thank you, man. Well, here, here's a here's one from Nick Sarandon. Do you remember the? Go, I'm gonna go kill a cow tomorrow. All right, there you go. Do you remember the connection between peanut butter and Hamilton? Hamilton the guy or Hamilton the play? Connection between peanut butter and Hamilton. Hmm. Oh, no. man. He didn't invent he, peanut butter. No, that was. That was uh, Skippy. That was Skippy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Skippy, yeah. <laughs> or Peter Pan. Peter Pan might have invented peanut butter, you know. Nah, he was busy doing something yeah. else. I, well, it's it was Annette, invented it Jeff. Yeah, it was Annette Funicello because she did peanut butter commercials for Jeff in the seventies. <laughs> she invented peanut butter. That's I'm going to go with Annette Funicello invented peanut yeah. butter. No. Uh, that was an old the, the, that was an old milk commercial. Alexander Ham, Alexander Hamilton and peanut butter had to do with an old milk commercial. Got milk. I remember I remember the got milk commercials. I remember the Alexander Hamilton and peanut butter. 
Where's where's Google? Let's park up Google here. Let's see what the hell's going on. <laughs> hey Google. Hey, there you go. Oh wait a minute. Hey Alexa. What's the combat? What's the connection between Alexander Hamilton and peanut butter? Let's see what she says. If she's so smart. Here's something I found on the web. Ooh. According to todayafound.com. This effect is made worse than with most foods due to the fact that peanut butter also has incredibly low water content, only about 2%. By the way, I can learn your voice to improve your Alexa experience. Would you like to try it? Not right now, Alexa. Thank you. She didn't know what she was talking about. She's talking Not about water all. content and peanut butter. I don't hey, John, I learned, I learned live demos can be very dangerous. That's it. <laughs> I was waiting for something to... I was waiting for something to jump out there. <laughs> yeah. uh, Alex is right behind me and she, she, she does a good job. You know, she, she plays music when I want her to, plays the news when I want her to, you know. I don't really have her order stuff for me. That's a little weird, you yeah, know. I understand. I just did tell Alexa to order me. I've, all of a sudden stuff starts showing up in my house and I have no idea what the hell it is. Too much but technology. Anyway. Too much. So it so the the connection between peanut butter and Hamilton was the milk was the got milk commercial Nick is that what you're telling me? Yeah, you remember? Cuz I'm not why was Alexander Hamilton in the got milk commercial? I don't I, those, those things been around since when? Those things since the 80s, right? The got milk? Or was that those a little bit later? Yeah. That's probably the 80s. Yeah. Man, I, my, my my recollection of the '80s is really not what it should be. <laughs> that was there was there was many there were many nights spent doing things that I'd really rather not talk about right now. That was me. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like the the disco lights now are gone on. They turned the lights down and the disco's going at Dave's house. <laughs> Hope we well, don't right. have anybody looking at Dave that's epileptic. Well, yeah, that, those flashing lights could cause a little bit of an issue. <laughs> yeah. 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 According to Google, the uh, Got Milk commercials were from the '90s. All right, I don't have I don't have a real good memory of the '90s either. I just and that's you know those 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 uh, events at Warsbo really did a number. Remember the remember the. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, and that's yes. why I quit. That's why I quit drinking because that would have killed me. I swear to God. <laughs> yeah, you guys know yeah. my rule. You gotta lim you gotta limit the intake when, when you're running hard three, four days in a row. Yep, absolutely. What do you got here? What Who is this? Who shot Alexander Hamilton? Peanut butter. All right, here we go. There's no there's no there's no audio, but I think don't think you can get audio on these, but. And now That's let's make that random call with today's $10,000 question. It's a tough one. Who shot Alexander Hamilton in that famous duel? Oh, right, he can't talk. He can't talk. His mouth's full of peanut butter, and he's going to miss it. Who for $10,000? Who shot Excuse me? Who shot Alexander <laughs> hey, cookies. So you know I think our neighbor would like that was brilliant. That was brilliant. <laughs> That's the connection. All right. You guys are gonna make me, uh, gonna make me take out my Tommy Boy videos for the training and start putting in some Alexander Hamilton peanut butter commercials. <laughs> hey, there you go. There you go. I love it. I love it. Oh, that that was brilliant. That was great. Hey, that's the power of YouTube and Google, man. I love it. All right. Uh, I was from 91 year old Ted Serena. Thanks for the series. 91 years old and still interested. Hey, Ted, thank you. God bless you. I'm glad you could be with us. That was that's terrific. That is terrific. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, listen, gents and ladies out there. Um, it's about nine o'clock, a little after nine, 908. 
So we're going to do one last call for questions. Otherwise, I think we should we should we should uh, say our goodbyes here. You know, say our say our, our farewells. I'm going to take this screen back because I prepared a little slide here. So uh, it comes back to me. Show my screen. Where is my screen? Do you see my screen? You do or you do not? I don't know. Yes, we do. We do. All right. Let's go. Let's go here. Okay. Kaboom. We we already saw that one. We went to go see this live in Chicago last year. It was really it's cool live. Uh, I've gone through a lot of rigmarole just for that slide. So thank you for a great summer. But it was an amazing show to see live. And then we watched it on Disney not too long ago, and it was really it was it was it was, it was really cool seeing it the second time around. And you know, and some on the TV on TV you can actually make out a lot more of the dialogue than you could when you heard it live. <laughs> so really great, great program. But uh, I want to say thank you to to Bruce. Always a pleasure, Bruce. I owe you a round of golf. So let's get this set up in the next couple of weeks uh, before you head to, before you head out again. Um, so Bruce, thank you so much. It's always great to see you, Dan and Tim. I'm so glad you guys could make it for make it tonight. This was really special. So really appreciate that. I appreciate the invite. And, yeah, well, uh, thanks and, for having us out tonight. Oh, my my pleasure, my honor. Thank you. Our our pleasure as well. It's just have it's it's just a great day to have the best in this the best this industry has to offer all in one one place with you guys. So really, thank you so much. And uh, and Dave and Rick, hey, thank you for being a part of this as well. I mean, this is uh this was really a great this is a great effort, and I really appreciate your input and 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 and. Uh, uh, and, and all you guys have done to to make Taco After Dark such a success. So I'm glad we had to do it. Uh, we we we've lost track of of John Messenbrink and Tim Ward from Mechanical Hub, who were really responsible for all this too. Uh, so a, a huge shout out to MechanicalHub.com, uh, a real good clearinghouse for trade information. It's really an online trade journal. When they do an awful lot of stuff on Instagram with Eric Lani. Uh, it's well worth your time and energy to follow those guys and, and see what they're up to because they, they bring a lot of great information to the table that uh, will be of benefit to you. So with that, any parting thoughts uh, from, from you guys? Dave, Rick. I don't know what I'm going to do next week now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what are we going to do next Wednesday? <laughs> it's going to be the, uh, you know, and I, I want to thank, uh, you know, Tim and Dan and, and everybody else that's attended. You know, I know Dan's been here since week two or something like that. And and uh, it, it's and for everybody else, I know those handful of guys that are still here that have been here, the hardcore going on all the time. One of the guys, uh, one of our winners is actually on vacation this week and is hanging out with us. So that's that wow. means a lot. You know, <laughs> it, he didn't have to be here tonight. He's on vacation away from this stuff and he's hanging out with us tonight. So um, and that means that's a lot. Vacation. So, yeah. So it it is interesting. It is fun, and and I can't wait to get back out there and see you all. Um, mm -hmm. I'm dying to. So every time I post anything, I put the word "c" in quotes. So you know, it's good to see you all, so to speak. But I got I I'm done down here. I got to get out of my basement. <laughs> <There> <laughs> you Thank go. you all. Thank you all. Yes. All right. Ricky, how are you? I really appreciate the uh, the offer, John, to join you. And, uh, as I said before. Call the number. Anytime you call, I'm there for you. Oh, thank you, Bruce. I really appreciate it. And again, honored to have you here as well. Just a, just a, just a great treat. Thank you so much. And uh, for taking time out of your your busy retirement. It sounds like you you. It's a nice break from having too much fun, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is fun too. <laughs> oh, good. 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 Rick, how about yourself? Oh, just uh, honored to be part of the whole thing. And um, thanks for everyone who has uh, been part of it. Uh, I hope we all collectively got our systems better, so to speak, and um, mm -hmm. we'll catch you on the next one. All righty. Thank you all. And uh, again, thanks for everybody for being here and thanks for the opportunity to uh, share some time with you and inviting us into your homes on uh, Wednesday nights. And uh, it's starting in early September, we'll have another, uh, we're going to be doing our factory training classes, but we're going to be doing them online in one hour segments. It'll be very similar to what we've been doing. Uh, we're going to do night sessions and we're going to do a daytime session as well. Give you the chance to 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 go to these different things. And we're looking at if, if Rick is game doing a later session for just the western west part. So it, it'll be normal. It'll be like 7 p.m. out on the western part of the country. 
but uh, it, it'll be really late here, but it'll be you know better for the guys out west, obviously. So we'll be doing that. Uh, we'll have a regular evening program, and then we'll have an option for the in the daytime, and then whatever else whatever else comes up, we'll, we'll still be doing Takeo Tuesdays, and uh, any other webinars anybody wants us. So, uh, so that's that's kind of the agenda for the rest of the year. But uh, on behalf of everybody here, I just want to say thank you all. It was a great uh, it was a it was a great fun and a great way to spend the summer. And uh, I wish you all the very best. Stay safe. Say say safe. Stay safe. Yes, yes. I said. Let's try that again. Stay safe. Yes, yes. Stay healthy and have a hell of a lot of fun. Take care, Cheers. everybody. Enjoy all. Thanks. Take care, guys.